The war in Ukraine has lasted longer than Russia expected, and now Moscow is on its knees begging some of the Allies to return weapons it previously sold to them so it can keep itself stocked up for a war that so far seems to have no end in sight. At least that's the immediate message that many have pulled from a November report published in the Wall Street Journal. Apparently secret talks have taken place, mostly focused on engines, with several countries meeting Moscow's demands. But is that report everything it's stacked up to be? That's the more interesting question. What may be seen as a sign of Russia's weakness in the face of a war that's gone on for too long may simply be an attempt by Russia to ensure it stays strong if support for Ukraine finally dwindles. Let's start by looking at what the report actually said. According to the WSJ, Moscow's entered secret talks with four countries in April 2022, Egypt, Belarus, Brazil, and Pakistan. The subjects of these talks appear to revolve around Moscow's desire to reclaim engines previously installed into Russian helicopters that Moscow needed to get back to strengthen its VKS, which is the country's air force. Immediately the date should come to your attention. April 2022, just two months after Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine. That's interesting when you realize that according to a report by the Imperial War Museum, Putin initially believed that Russia would be able to take control of Ukraine in as little as 10 days. Obviously, that didn't happen. As of the making of this video, it's been over 20 months since the conflict started, and the war is raging as hard as ever. By April 2022, Moscow would have realized that Ukraine is clearly not the pushover it thought it would be. And that realization would have led to the Kremlin concluding that it needed more weaponry, especially enhanced air support, to continue its invasion, hence the request to return the engines. The fact that these engines supposedly came from Russian helicopters, rather than being made to order, essentially grounded a crucial part of the VKS to the point where many of Moscow's helicopters were unusable until it got the engines back. Russia's arrogance came back to bite it. What's even more interesting is the responses varied when Russia returned with its tail between its legs and its cap in its hands to the countries that had received these engines. According to the WSJ, the first delegation Russia sent out landed in Cairo, with a request that Egypt return at least 100 of the engines it had received from Russia. Egypt reportedly complied. The report states that the first delivery of engines from Cairo, likely to be 150 strong, probably began in December though the WSJ sources couldn't confirm if more would be on their way. It's also telling that Egypt refused an American request to provide weapons and financial aid to Ukraine at around that same time. Perhaps Cairo saw the return of these engines as a chance to strengthen its relationship with Russia after what it likely saw as Moscow's inevitable victory in the war. A similar meeting in Belarus also bore fruit for Moscow, though that fruit was a lot lighter than that gained from Egypt. The report says Belarus agreed to send six Mi-26 helicopter engines back to Russia after its covert meeting, a small victory for Moscow but a victory nonetheless. However, the country's meetings with Brazil and Pakistan appear to have been less successful. When approached for comment, Brazil claims it refused to comply with Russia's request. Russia wanted the return of 12 engines for Mi-35M military helicopters, with Brazil saying it abandoned the deal in face of disruption of other deals caused by the Ukraine conflict. Then there's Pakistan. Unlike the other three countries in which talks are all but confirmed to have taken place, Pakistan claims that it never received a request. This is contradicted by the WSJ's report, stating that Moscow asked to buy back four Mi-35M engines that it had earlier sold to Pakistan. Whether Pakistan actually did so is unknown, given the country is claiming those talks never took place. Pakistan may be acting like the talks didn't happen because it doesn't want to give the wrong impression to the US about its relationship with Russia. After all, the US Embassy and Consulate in Pakistan claims that the states have provided about $32 billion in aid to Pakistan over the last two decades. That aid, both humanitarian and militaristic, has been drying up in recent years, with Pakistan likely not wanting a request from Russia to be the reason the US pulls out even more of its money. Still, it's clear that Russia was desperate to get these helicopter engines back, even offering to buy them in the process. The question now is simple, why? We've already covered the most obvious answer, which is that these engines weren't manufactured specifically for sale. They were pulled out of Russia's existing helicopter fleet, which proved to be a problem once it was quickly revealed just how disastrous the tactics of Russia's air force were in Ukraine. In the November 2022 report published in Forbes, it was revealed that Valery Zaluzhny, the Ukrainian military commander-in-chief, estimated that Ukraine had shot down 278 Russian aircraft. That article goes on to claim that this is likely an exaggeration, 
but it does say that between February and November of 2022, Ukraine had brought down 54 helicopters along with 55 Russian fighter jets. Those are big numbers, far bigger than Putin was expecting. And with so many of his helicopters destroyed, it is no surprise that he needed to replenish his stock. But many of the helicopters he had left didn't have any engines, forcing him to go back to the very countries in which he'd sold those engines in the first place. In short, Putin needed the engines so he could get more helicopters off the ground. However, there are other potential reasons. In March 2023, Ukraine's Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council, Alexei Danilov, wrote on X, formerly Twitter, about how he believed that Russia was starting to run low on its weapon stockpile. He said Russia is running out of prepared stockpiles of weapons. Missiles and military equipment have been accumulating for decades. The calculations called for blitzkrieg, not blitz utilization. In other words, though the Russians might have had a ton of weapons stockpiled, many of them simply weren't ready to deploy in Ukraine. Danilov claims that most still aren't, again pointing out that Russia expected Ukraine to fold almost instantly to a blitzkrieg. When that didn't happen, Putin had to recalculate and prepare for an extended war, hence his need to go begging the other countries that Moscow had sold weapons to in order to get them back. Danilov goes on to claim that Russia's corrupt economy is to blame for its supposed inability to produce new weapons. He then calls foreign aid a matter of primary importance for Moscow, again implying that Russia has had to seek help from outside its borders just to maintain the war effort in Ukraine. How much of these claims are simply Ukrainian propaganda rather than reality is unclear. We know that Russia asked for helicopter engines back. According to Newsweek, Russia had also received large quantities of Shahed-136 drones from Iran, with rumors still flying around that China is also supplying weapons to the Russian war effort. So that gives us two potential reasons why Russia is begging for its weapons back. There's the obvious one. It needs helicopter engines to get its choppers into the air. But if Danilov is to be believed, the issue extends beyond Russia simply selling off what it likely considered unnecessary stock in the past. Instead, Russia might have a production crisis hampered by corruption. That's preventing it from manufacturing the weapons it needs to subdue Ukraine. And subjugation is going to be high on the Russian agenda, as it knows that Ukraine is receiving weapons from foreign allies, meaning that it has to bolster its own stockpiles just to keep pace. At the beginning of November 2023, reports confirmed that a Ukrainian missile strike had killed three Russian colonels in the headquarters of Russia's Dnipyar military group. That's a small victory for Ukraine, but it's not the important part of the story. According to a Telegram channel that supposedly has inside information about Russia's security forces, the missiles that landed weren't made in Ukraine, they were made in the United States. Specifically, they were Army Tactical Missile Systems, or ATACMS. The missiles, which have a range of about 100 miles, hit their target and took out three leaders of the force that Russia had created specifically to hold the Dnipro region. This has to be worrying news for Putin. Not only has he lost three high-ranking military officers to a missile strike, but he knows that those missiles came from the US. Of course, it's no secret that Ukraine is relying on foreign aid, financially and militarily speaking, but the fact that Ukraine is receiving this aid likely hints at why Russia is asking for its own weapons back. It's not fighting the Ukraine it thought it would be fighting. Ukraine is better armed than Russia expected thanks to foreign intervention, meaning the stockpile Russia had gathered for the war simply isn't enough. It needs more. That's why its arms trade is in such dire straits right now. According to foreign policy, exports of weapons out of Russia have fallen to levels not seen since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Not because Russia doesn't have the weapons, rather it doesn't have weapons it can sell because it's having to dedicate more of them than it expected to the war due to Ukraine having support from so many Western allies. So not only is Putin trying to claw back weapons that he previously sold, but he's having to curtail one of Russia's most lucrative boom industries in the process. Russia can't sell weapons. All it can do is buy them back and manufacture more to support its war effort. That need for weapons is thrown into a stark light thanks to another November Newsweek report that discusses how Ukraine's armored vehicle fleet has reached the Dnieper River's east bank. Located in southern Ukraine, the river is currently controlled by Russia, though that control doesn't seem likely to last. Kyiv reported that it reached the river's occupied side back in October 2023, with the armored vehicle fleet serving as reinforcement for the troops that were already there. That occupation came 10 months after Ukraine managed to liberate the city of Kherson, located on the river's west bank, at the end of 2022. According to the Institute for the Study of War, a think tank in the United States, 
Ukraine's ambitions don't end with that river's west bank. It says that reports from Russian military bloggers suggest that Ukraine already has 300 people operating on the east side, with its goal now being to establish a base there so it can launch an offensive on the village of Krynki. Should Ukraine manage to take that village, it'll establish itself in a region that would allow it to launch further attacks on Russian supply lines, damaging Moscow's ability to take territory back. Again, we start seeing reasons why Russia is increasingly turning toward foreign aid. Not only is it depleting its existing resources in a war that's become far more drawn out than it thought it would be, but it's not actively winning that war. Ukraine is retaking territory from Russia, and from a Russian perspective, that territory needs to be reclaimed, which would mean more troops, more weapons, and more equipment at a time when Russia is supposedly running low on two of the three. The ground situation is looking increasingly desperate for Russia, but it's not doing much better at sea either. Another November Newsweek report focused on Ukraine's clever asymmetrical tactics on the Black Sea Fleet, the naval vessels that Russia is relying on to give it a route into southern Ukraine. Those attacks, which combine assaults by Western-supplied missiles and drones, hit their high point in November when a cruise missile strike landed on the Askold, a once powerful Russian cruiser. The ship is believed by many to be beyond repair, based on what satellite imagery shows of it now that it's docked in Crimea Zaliv shipyard. Ukraine currently believes it's been taken out of the game, with its Office of Strategic Communication stating that the cruiser suffered significant damage and may not be repaired. While that strike is important, we see the true extent of why it worries Moscow when we look at the Black Sea Fleet as a whole. Since the Russian invasion, Ukraine has managed to hit 17 of Russia's seaborne vessels. Not all are part of the Black Sea Fleet. However, according to Newsweek, even those that aren't in the fleet were still operating in that area and likely cooperating with it. Worse yet for Putin, Ukraine hasn't focused all of its missile and drone attacks on ships. It's also targeting infrastructure. Defensive positions, command posts, and even the Sevastopol port that serves as the Black Sea Fleet's headquarters have all been targeted. Ukraine's attacks have a clear purpose – remove Russia from the Black Sea so that it can open up supply lines and navigational options that the Russians are trying to cut off. By taking out the Askold, Ukraine has removed one more ship, one capable of firing cruise missiles, ahead of the winter months. What's more shocking about Ukraine's success against the Black Sea Fleet is that the country barely has a naval force of its own, but it hasn't needed a navy. Once again, it's been able to rely on missiles and drones supplied by Western allies to take the fight to Russia's ships. The attacks on the Black Sea Fleet are so severe that Russia has been forced to flee from their main base in Sevastopol. On October 7, 2023, Al Jazeera published a report that pointed out how satellite imagery showed that at least 12 Russian vessels including submarines, missile frigates, and landing ships, had moved from Sevastopol to other Russian-controlled ports. Some of those vessels ended up in smaller bases in Crimea, though the bulk ended up in Novorossiysk, a Russian port that's 186 miles away from Sevastopol. James Hapy, the British defense minister, called this the functional defeat of the Black Sea Fleet. Forced to abandon its main headquarters, the fleet is now dispersed to the point where it's no longer able to launch coordinated attacks against Ukraine. Beyond damaging ships, Ukraine also managed to destroy a shipyard with a dry dock that was crucial for Russian repairs. The Black Sea isn't free of Russian ships by any means, but it's far less dangerous to Ukraine than it used to be. These are losses that Russia did not expect to suffer. And again, they're losses that are only made possible because Ukraine has managed to secure missiles and drones from other countries. Even more reason for Russia to claw back some of its own weapons. What's good for the goose is good for the gander with Russia's weapons and equipment buybacks ensuring its stockpiles keep pace with Ukraine's. But perhaps it's not really Ukraine that Russia's trying to match. It's the country's age-old enemy, the United States. The war in Ukraine hasn't been a conflict between two countries. The West has gotten heavily involved, albeit with funding and equipment rather than troops, and Putin finds himself fighting a battle against the US just as much as he's fighting with Ukraine. Global tensions have risen. And with Putin's repeated threats of the possibility of using nuclear warheads in Ukraine, a renewed focus has been placed on the nuclear stockpiles of both Russia and the US, and both are extensive. According to Newsweek, the two world powers account for 89% of the entire world's inventory of nuclear warheads. The countries are close to neck and neck in terms of their stockpiles, with Russia coming out slightly on top. The situation is worrying enough for the US that its House of Representatives passed a resolution in October that would provide an extra $19.114 billion for the continued modernization of the country's nuclear arms. 
That action alone is a swift reminder that for all of Russia's begging to get equipment back from other countries, it still presents a very clear danger to Ukraine. Yes, Ukraine has managed to last far longer in the war than anybody, Russia especially, predicted. And with the backing of Western equipment, it's been able to engage in a war of attrition that has left Moscow scrambling to reclaim previously sold equipment. But Russia still has 5,889 stockpiled or retired nuclear warheads. The US isn't far behind, maintaining a stock of 5,244 warheads, but the Federation of American Scientists said that Russia is believed to be increasing its stockpiles. Perhaps asking for its old equipment and weaponry back is less a sign of stockpile shortages on Russia's end. It may just be that the country is trying to strengthen itself in every way possible, not only to beat back Ukrainian advantages in the war, but to ensure it's ready to fight other battles if Putin does push the nuclear button. However, Russia may not need to go that far. For all the support that Ukraine has received from its Western allies, Moscow may still feel that it has enough equipment and arms stockpiled that it'll outlast its enemy. And that feeling could be buoyed by recent reports that suggest bad news for Ukraine's future. Support from other countries is drying up. According to a November report in The Guardian, the special fund that the US allocated for Ukraine is 96% depleted. In other words, it's almost all gone, and there's no guarantee that more money is coming. Though President Joe Biden has asked Congress to pass a bill that would secure an additional $106 billion for its overseas military fund, which would also benefit Israel, he doesn't have complete support for the motion. That's highlighted in an August survey conducted by CNN, which shows that a very slim majority of Americans, 51%, believe that the country has already done enough to help Ukraine. There's also an increasing divide between Democrats and Republicans on the Ukraine issue. Though 62% of Democrats say that additional funding is needed, just 28% of Republicans agree. Combine that faltering popular support with a speaker issue in the House of Representatives, which have at times rendered the House useless, and Biden's bill may have a hard time passing anytime soon. That is terrible news for Ukraine, which has become increasingly reliant on US aid and the situation goes from bad to worse when you expand the scope of the other countries providing aid to Ukraine. For example, Slovakia's new government has rejected a previously agreed-upon military aid package, following through on its promise to end aid to Kyiv if it were to be elected. That amounts to the loss of 140 air defense rockets, along with about 4 million rounds of ammunition for small arms lost in the blink of an eye. The UK may also be struggling to back up its desired support for Ukraine in its war effort, Though support for Ukraine remains fairly high in the country, there are rumors that the UK is simply running out of arms to send over. That's according to The Telegraph, which reported on a senior military official in Britain saying that the UK has run out of defense equipment and that other countries should start shouldering more of the burden. Poland, which has long been one of Ukraine's biggest allies, has also cut Kyiv off. A report in The Guardian points out that a dispute between Poland and Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, over Poland banning Ukrainian grain imports, has escalated to the point where Poland has said enough. Poland's president Andrzej Duda fired back, claiming that Ukraine is like a drowning person clinging to anything available. And on September 20th, Poland struck a huge blow when its prime minister, Mateusz Morawiecki, said that it was no longer sending arms to Ukraine because it was focusing on modernizing its own military. None of this will have escaped Russia's notice. As it looks at the situation in Ukraine, it may think it's seeing rats fleeing from a sinking ship. Yes, Ukraine enjoyed overwhelming support when the war started near the beginning of 2022, but it's nearly the end of 2023 and the war isn't over yet. Support for Ukraine is drying up as the world becomes increasingly war-weary, and various countries find themselves as concerned about their own futures as they are about Ukraine's. Perhaps this all casts a different light on Russia begging other countries for the return of equipment. Maybe the Kremlin saw this coming after its blitzkrieg failed, with its attempts to get arms back simply being a way to reinforce itself so it could stay in the war for the long haul. After all, aid to Ukraine can't last forever. We're seeing that now as several countries have already withdrawn their support, while some of Ukraine's richest allies, especially the UK and the US, may field budgetary concerns in the near future. Even Poland, which has developed one of continental Europe's best militaries, is out of the picture, at least for now, which is only good news for the Russians. Was Russia's reclamation of previously sold arms really an act of desperation once it realized that Ukraine wouldn't go down so easily? Or was it a tactical move to reinforce its stockpiles, maximizing its military's future potential in the process? Because Russia knew that support for Ukraine couldn't last forever. The smart money seems to fall on the latter, 
especially amidst reports that Russia is supposedly cooperating with China and building its already impressive nuclear reserves. But what do you think? Did Russia beg for its old weapons back, or did it adapt well to a war of attrition that seems to be inching closer to winning as support for Ukraine wavers? Tell us what you think below. Day 1, 12.01 AM local, 53,000 feet above Borispil, Ukraine. The engines of the Raptor generate a mild roar somewhere behind US Air Force Captain Kieran Campbell's head, but he doesn't notice. His eyes are glued to his HUD ears cued to the warning tone from his radar that'll let him know enemy fighters are in the air. Well, not his radar. The entire 20-strong squadron of Raptors are all flying noses cold. Turning on their powerful ASA radars would be a dead giveaway for Russian fighters and ground batteries. Instead, the Raptors are being fed information from a loitering AWACS platform, one of four currently in the skies over Ukraine. This lets them remain stealthy until the last possible moment. The AWACS are a high-priority target to defend, and Captain Campbell is concerned about Russia's Su-57 Felon fleet. Intel is confident the Russians only have five that can be put into battle. The Russian plane is stealth light, but could still get more than close enough to pop a missile or two at the AWACS before being detected. Campbell expected the Felon to be in the skies tonight. Russia had three months advance warning of what was coming. Now the US Air Force was laying the hammer down. And it was his job to keep the bombers and the 4th Gen fighters safe long enough for them to do their job. A double beep pulled his attention back to the radar. There, as expected, a Russian combat air patrol. Moments later, the AWACS computer classified it as a Su-30 in loose formation with his flight of four. The Russians had been stepping up their air combat patrols in recent weeks, aware that the US had nearly finished its preparations for war. Why they hadn't struck first when it was most advantageous to them was a mystery, but in all likelihood they simply didn't have the platforms to do so anymore. Besides, US Air Forces had used Poland as a staging area. An attack on Polish soil would trigger NATO's Article 5, and Poland was literally looking for an excuse to fight some Russians. Range 237 miles and closing. Not quickly, though. The first time the AWACS had taken to the sky in a four-ship formation was five weeks ago, and Russia had immediately scrambled their air defense assets, as if the US would be so stupid as to broadcast the start of its attack like that. Still, they scrambled their full air defense contingent on the second, third, and fourth nights too. On the fifth, they merely added two extra caps to the Eastern Front. It had been awfully nice of the Russians to rehearse their response to an attack so publicly. Captain Campbell looked at the digital clock display. Yep, the war should be just about to officially be on any second now. After a moment later, his radio crackled with a single word cryptic. The squadron's computers communicated with each other via directional bursts to lessen the chance of being detected, each bird being assigned its own target. Campbell often felt like he was merely accompanying the computer that controlled so much of the jet, was pretty sure in another 10 years he'd be obsolete altogether. At least for now, though, he got to press the button. The F-22 shuddered slightly as its weapons bay opened and compromised his stealth for approximately two and a half seconds. In that time, though, two AIM-120 missiles were ejected and the doors were already shut. The missiles rocketed upwards into the sky where the air was extremely thin and they'd meet little resistance. Once their rockets burned out, they'd be on a terminal trajectory pouncing down on the low-flying MiGs from above. A minute and a half later, Campbell could see the MiGs begin to peel away on his radar. It was unlikely they detected his F-22 from nearly 70 miles away, so he supposed that the ground-based S-400 had detected him and relayed the warning to the cap. He was unconcerned. It was one thing to detect the presence of a stealth fighter, another thing altogether to get a high-quality weapons lock on it. According to Russian sources, the S-400 should be able to lock onto him from around two dozen or so miles. At around 80 miles or so, all they could do was warn friendly aircraft. Those aircraft had two choices, run, knowing that if an American stealth aircraft had been detected, it had probably already fired long-range missiles at them, or gun it, closing the distance as fast as possible to engagement distance. The smarter option was run, but it was no guarantee of safety. The AIM-120s were going over Mach 4 when their rockets cut off and only slightly slowed with little air resistance in the upper atmosphere. The Russian planes executed a pretty aggressive turn before gunning their engines, but the turn cost them serious airspeed that they had to regain. It wasn't enough. Campbell's squadron had shot well inside the maximum range of the AIM-120, and it had serious legs. The Russians realized it too, as they dipped their noses to the ground in an attempt to notch the incoming missiles. Now in active guidance mode and setting off the MiG's warning receivers, the sky erupts with flares as the MiG's try to shake their pursuers, but the AIM-120s have activated radar guidance in their terminal phase and are unaffected by the countermeasure. One by one, the Russian MiG's are blown out of the sky. 12.18 PM local, 5 meters over the Black Sea. 
48 short-winged jet black shapes roar just feet over the tops of the Black Sea's waves. The weapons look like flying fish and behave much like them rising and falling with the wave tops as their advanced onboard sensors detect the wave height of the sea in front of them and adjust to stay as low as possible. The LRASMs are the US's answer to the threat of the Chinese Navy. The explosive growth of the Chinese Navy and its technological advancement had made it clear that the Cold War ship-killing mainstay of the US Navy, the Harpoon Missile, was no longer a deterrent. The LRASM was the future, and the future was screaming toward the Russian Black Sea Fleet, bringing 48 1,000-pound blast fragmentation warheads with it. The missiles have been under the radar of the lead Russian picket, the guided missile frigate Ladny, for most of their journey, using the curvature of the Earth to their advantage. However, as they near the targets, the missiles are brought into full exposure of the searching radar beams. Their stealthy construction and use of stealth materials, however, buys them the time to get closer. Aboard the Ladny, a Russian radar technician is picking up faint returns of something. He immediately shouts an alarm. The returns are growing in intensity and approaching very rapidly. The air defense computer immediately turns its high-frequency radars in the direction of the incoming missiles, but the track isn't good enough for a weapons lock yet. The Russian sailor sits, helpless, looking at his screen, and knowing that every second the missiles draw closer, the less time the fleet's defenses will have to engage them. He's been told not to fear American weapons when he first joined the Navy. They were all propaganda and hype. But seeing what had happened to the army on the wrong side of the American smart weapons donated to Ukraine had given him doubts. Serious doubts. Without human input, the volley of nine M311 missiles scream out of their launch cells, traveling at supersonic speeds. The merge velocity between the air defense missiles and the lead LRASM is several times the speed of sound. Too fast for the Russian computer. Air defense missiles scream past the lead LRASM, but the last missile in the volley finds its target. One LRASM is disintegrated in mid-flight. 47 more are mere seconds behind. The other ships of the fleet now fire on the incoming missile volley. Working together via data link, the accuracy against the speedy, stealthy American missiles doesn't improve much. But volume increases the odds, and over 100 air defense missiles have been fired in 90 seconds. 15 more of the $4 million American missiles are destroyed. Inside the Ladny, the crew nearest the Sea Whiz station endures the teeth-rattling roar of the 30mm cannons. The tracers make it look like streams of liquid fire are reaching out into the dark. Other ships' last-ditch defenses roar to life, the fleet maneuvering to present a broadside of Sea Whiz cannons to the incoming attack. The lead LRASM is untouched and seconds later smashes into the side of the Ladny. The warhead is designed to detonate shortly after impact, allowing the kinetic energy of the strike to push it deep into the guts of the ship before exploding. The effect is devastating, as the 1,000-pound warhead explodes deep in the guts of the ship. Two seconds before impact, the ship Sea Whiz saves it from a second LRASM. It doesn't have the time to stop the third. The data-sharing missiles use their AI to maximize damage to the enemy ship and de-conflict targets. With the first missile having successfully penetrated into the belly of the ship, the third missile redirects slightly. Its artificial intelligence uses its infrared imager to verify the ship in front of it as the Ladny from an image database. With the ship's identity confirmed, the AI redirects the missile to strike on the bridge of the ship. The damage is catastrophic and the Ladny is put out of action to sink the next day. Tracer fire from Sea Whiz, even from manned machine guns, lights up the skies. More LRASMs go down. Even more don't, however. The stealthy missiles speak to each other, deconflicting targets and ensuring that the missiles aren't wasted or destroyed on disabled ships. The sound of 1,000-pound warheads ripping steel apart fills the air. 250 miles away, the F-18 attack wave launched from a U.S. carrier off the coast of Greece is well on its way back home. Most of the superbugs have been outfitted with LRASMs in the anti-ship role. Those flying air cover for their partner's size, they cruise back to the carrier. The extended range of these new weapons means there'll be no chance to shoot down MiGs tonight. Day 3 Zero two thirty six hours, local, east bank of the Dnipro River, Nova Kakovka. Bliet! Vikenti threw himself to the floor of his trench at the telltale high pitched shriek of incoming ordnance. He'd been out of his trench pissing a moment ago, and now his pants were around his ankles, mostly covered in piss. Better than being clean and dead, though. The high pitched shriek was accompanied by several more, and then a series of strange popping noises all in rapid succession. Vikenti nearly fainted as he felt the soft impact of many small things against his body and held his breath waiting for the end. Five seconds later, though, nothing happened. A full minute later, Vikentny finally found the courage to lift his head up from the floor of the trench to discover it filled with paper. It was paper, but Vikentny couldn't read it in the darkness. Instead, he pulled his pants up and kept crouched in his trench. 
a handful of the papers in one of his hands. Five minutes later, there was no further sound of incoming fire, and somebody shouted all clear. McKentney gave it an extra 30 seconds just to be sure. He wasn't directly on the front line, or what would soon be the front line as he suspected. Instead, his trench was closer to the town of Nova Kakovka rather than the network right off the bank of the Dnipro River. That's the only reason he felt safe enough to flick on a flashlight so he could look at his papers. Several other soldiers joined him now that they were clearly not under attack. Yeah, you piss yourself? His only real friend out there on the front, Yorick, was also a conscript. His whole unit was, and so was the unit next to them. Other than the officers who constantly yelled at them before retreating to their command posts far, far in the rear, he couldn't remember the last time he saw a proper Russian army soldier. No, I, it was before the bomb just, shut up, I'm trying to read. Yes, read, what is this? One of the other soldiers encouraged him. He looked like he'd come from the poor eastern provinces of Russia, explained why he didn't know how to read. Each paper was the same as the others, written in two languages. Judging by the illustrated pictures, he guessed the back of it said the same thing as the front did in Russian. It's from the Americans. It's a warning that we should surrender. Pizdets. They think we'll surrender just because they ask? One of the soldiers spit on the ground. No, the paper says we should surrender to save our own lives. In 24 hours, they'll use precision weapons on this position. He showed the paper to the huddled soldiers, pointing at one of the illustrations which clearly showed a bomb on an arced trajectory that put it directly inside of a trench and above the head of a soldier hiding inside it. Yurik laughed, crumpled up the paper that he was holding and tossed it out of the trench. What a joke. They expect to scare us into surrendering with papers? You fool. You don't know history, do you? They did the same in Iraq the first time, but nobody really knew about precision bombs. They dropped leaflets right on the heads of the Iraqis warning them to surrender. A day later, they destroyed everything left behind. The group went silent for a moment. Some of the soldiers looked at the leaflets again with their own flashlights, reading them carefully to themselves. It's just propaganda. Yurik didn't sound very confident. Look around you. Look at the trench, covered in paper now. The Kentney was right. Whatever the Americans had used to deliver their message had dropped it literally on top of their heads. There was silence once more amongst the conscripted soldiers. Paper also has instructions on how to surrender to American or Ukrainian troops. There was even more silence after that, then one of the conscripts spoke up. Impossible. Comrade Colonel warned us anyone seeking to surrender would be shot. Yeah, besides, there's an entire defense works in front of us and a river between us and them. The group was silent again. McKintney cleared his throat. Maybe it's better odds out there than sitting in here. He was speaking treason, but he could see from the faces around him everyone else was thinking it too. What if we ask Comrade Colonel to move positions? The Americans know where we are. We should change our defenses. McKintney shook his head at Yurik. You think Comrade Colonel will listen? And you think the Americans won't just find new positions anyway? He was pretty sure about the first part, but not about the second part. He knew, as did pretty much every Russian soldier now, that the US had been sharing intelligence with Ukraine on Russian movements and positions, but that was from a distance and before it officially joined the war. Who knew what capabilities they'd had now that they were in the war itself? It had just been a matter of great discussion as it became clearer and clearer that the US was joining the war. Most of the conscripts attributed nearly godlike capabilities to the American forces. Others, usually those who hadn't yet been on the receiving end of precision weapons donated to the Ukrainians, scoffed and claimed it was all propaganda. As if to punctuate the group's fear, a series of distant explosions rang out. He wasn't sure, but Vikentny believed they came from the direction of forward air defenses. If their air defenses couldn't even protect themselves from American missiles and aircraft, what hope did they have? Listen, it'll be light in three hours. I say we wait until nightfall tomorrow. Vikentny outlined a rough plan. Three of the five conscripts would follow him the next night into the pitch black of the Ukrainian countryside. Two would remain. They would be dead 24 hours later. Day 8, 1,548 hours local, Donetsk front. Air defense radar registered the attack as a flock of birds. As they neared though, it became obvious these weren't any ordinary birds. Point air defenses lit up the sky with tracer fire, but the expensive S-400, capable of intercepting even ballistic missiles, could do nothing to stop the attack. Machine gun and cannon fire strafed the sky, blowing Switchblade 600 drones to pieces. But even the radar-guided fire wasn't enough to stop the drone swarm attack. Armed with a warhead capable of defeating armored vehicles, the unarmored missile batteries and their support communications and radar equipment were no match. Two bulk SAM systems took two direct hits from two separate drones. Only the Tor batteries had any real effect on the drone swarm, but they too were easily overwhelmed. At the cost of 38 drones, an entire link in the Russian air defense network had been taken offline. The attack is part of the US Air Force's and Navy's continued effort to degrade enemy air defenses. The dense network of ground-based air defenses, backed up by fighter support, has made it difficult to operate directly over the front line. 
but the United States concentrates its SEAD capabilities to punch a hole across a 50-mile front. 38 miles from the destroyed S-400 site, Russian soldiers begin firing up at the sky with wild abandon. Desperate machine gun fire reaches up to the swarm of drones quickly moving over their position. Some are taken down, most aren't. The drones pitch their noses down and begin plummeting into the trenches below. The smaller Switchblade 300s carry a much lighter warhead meant to take out personnel, but evading them in the trenches is impossible. The blast fragmentation warheads kill few but seriously injure many more. Hot on the heels of the drone swarms, the distinctive chopping sound of approaching helicopters. Flying low to the ground, the incoming American Apaches suddenly pop up to gain altitude. The drones have thrown the Russians into disarray. Only two Russian Verva manned portable air defense missiles are fired up to the Apaches. One is defeated by countermeasures, the other scores a direct hit on an American Apache, throwing the chopper into an uncontrolled and deadly spin. The other Apaches immediately, however, pounce on the position of the Russian shooters, disgorging rocket and cannon fire, obliterating the firing positions. Other Apaches provide top cover on the lookout for more man pads. As soon as one is spotted, the Apache dives down into it, disrupting the shooter with cannon and rocket fire, if not killing them outright. The remaining Apaches strafe the Russian trenches. Desperate Russians fire back at the Apaches, but the machines aren't just fast and agile, they're tough. A Russian opens his machine gun on an Apache strafing a nearby trench, only to have the bullets bounce off the armored canopy. The self-sealing capabilities of the fuel tank plug any holes, and redundant hydraulics limit the damage inflicted on the body of the chopper itself. Now angry, the Apache spins on its axis faster than the Russian expected it to. A short burst of cannon fire obliterates him and his weapon. Another Apache is taken down by a manpad, only for the shooter himself to be blasted into chunks by its vengeful brethren. For Russians still huddling in their trenches, the ground begins to quake under the approaching mass of American armor. Two M1150 assault breacher vehicles lead two columns of American Abrams and Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. The assault element fans out and begins to put long-range fire on the trenches. Meanwhile, the M1150s fire their linear demolition charge system, a 100-yard line charge that lands on the ground and after a moment detonates. The explosion is powerful enough to set off most mines. The M1150s also drop their 4.6-meter plows into the dirt and gun the engines. The 1,500-horsepower engine and chassis are the exact same as those made for the M1 Abrams, and the vehicle is quickly chewing several feet into the dirt. Mines not exploded by the line charges are harmlessly detonated by the plow. Engineers are quick to mark off the entrance to the cleared lane as an element of tanks and IFVs pour in behind them. The rest remain to continue putting long-range fire on enemy trenches a few hundred yards away. The threat of anti-tank missiles and guns is mitigated by the prowling Apaches, which routinely pounce from above on the trenches. Miles away, another flight of Apaches lay waste to an artillery position. With the S-400 node offline, Russia can only respond with fighter jets. However, as multiple air defense units are vectored in on the helicopters, they're swatted out of the sky by lurking F-35s. The F-35s still enjoy the cover of AWACS aircraft, which Russia has been unable to effectively threaten this whole time. This lets them remain nose-cold and not give away their location. With the artillery and enemy front suppressed, the threat to the armor assault is greatly mitigated but not entirely negated. Several anti-tank missiles are fired from the trenches, four of which find their marks. One is defeated by an Abrams trophy system, the other two strike home. One strikes toward the front of the vehicle though, killing the driver and immobilizing the tank. The other takes a direct hit on the turret and is destroyed. The fourth missile strikes the lead assault breacher vehicle which sputters to a stop. A backup vehicle immediately moves into position and shoves the destroyed vehicle to the side. With the use of more line charges and their plows, the assault element manages to breach the Russian minefields, at which point American armor rushes out of the cleared lanes to immediately flank or simply overrun the Russian trenches. The Apaches still prowl overhead, and far in the distance a column of Russian armor moving to reinforce the breach is engaged by long-range precision Excalibur artillery rounds and guided rockets from the MLRS batteries. Russian soldiers surrender en masse under the combined arms onslaught, or put up futile resistance that only ends in one way. The few armored vehicles that survive the Apaches above are easy prey for the Abrams, equipped with better fire control computers and sensors. The networked capability of the American forces gives the assault unparalleled situational awareness. Trench by trench, dismounted infantry clear the Russians from their positions and protect the tanks from ATGM threats. 
The Russians are a depleted force, having long ago spent the best part of its military and supplies against the Ukrainian defense. It's like seeing armies from two different centuries meeting on the battlefield. The assault force punches into the rear of the Russian defenses and then dovetails into two elements. One goes north while the other goes south. Both will take advantage of their superb mobility to continue pressing the assault, only this time straight into the rear of neighboring Russian defenses. More mine-clearing engineers soon arrive to add additional safe lanes of travel, through which hundreds of Ukrainian vehicles and infantry begin to pour. American technology and firepower kicked in the door, but it's a Ukrainian spear that punches nearly 100 kilometers into the heart of Russian-occupied territory. Day 15, 2214 local hours, two miles west of Kherson. Two big 4-meter missiles roar to life. Each artillery battery consists of six MLRS vehicles, with two batteries firing in total, with two Attackums missiles per vehicle. In moments, 24 of the missiles were in the air, each carrying a GPS-guided 500-pound explosive warhead. The missiles arc out over liberated Kherson like massive fireworks, then continue to climb until they reach 160,000 feet. Russian air defense networks quickly pick up the big bulky missiles, which lack any stealth characteristics whatsoever. S-400 units around Crimea are quickly tasked to service the attack, networking together to assign individual launchers to each incoming missile. Working together, various S-400 sites around Crimea begin to spit out interceptors with a pop of gas. Once the missile is 30 meters away from the launch unit, it ignites its rocket motor and screams into the night sky. Each of the American missiles have been assigned two interceptors. Air defense computers have reached several conclusions on the projected trajectories, the most concerning of which is the Kirk Bridge. But this is also one of Russia's best defended footholds in Ukraine, and the S-400 interceptors make easy work of the non-stealthy American missiles. Not a single one survives. Day 18, 0154 local, 48,000 feet above the Black Sea. After refueling off the coast of Bulgaria, the F-18 strike force has been flying northeast for the last 15 minutes. The carrier planes aren't trying to hide their location and blast ahead with their powerful active electronically scanned array radars. Two AWACS units flown in support of the attack extend the radar coverage umbrella deep into occupied Crimea. Prowling on the east coast of the peninsula are the telltale returns of Russian fighters. The Super Hornets launch a volley of decoys toward the Crimean Peninsula. The decoys have been quickly retrofitted to fit any U.S. Navy fighter aircraft, and once deployed, can mimic the radar and electronic emissions of any U.S. aircraft. Now they're playing the role of more Super Hornets. With each aircraft firing two of the large decoys, their numbers have in effect tripled. The Russian Air Defense Network immediately begins tasking interceptors to the incoming air attack. The S-400 missiles roar off their launch platforms and into the air. The Crimean Peninsula is lit from above by the glare of dozens of rockets all screaming out toward the Black Sea. Russian caps are vectored in toward the approaching F-18s. Odds are the Americans are also attacking using their stealth aircraft, either F-35s or F-22s. The S-400 radars, however, have yet to detect any stealth aircraft, and the Russian pilots don't have much of a choice either way. At least there's a sizable number of F-18s, and both sides' missiles can lock onto each other's non-stealthy 4th-gen fighters at approximately the same distance. The Americans have indeed sent their F-35s to support the F-18s. Until now, they've just been hiding amongst the Super Hornets, their stealth enhanced by the obvious noise of the 4th-gen jets. Hiding amongst older planes allows them to remain undetected, and now they sprint forward ahead of the F-18s. Volleys of AIM-120s fill the sky as the Super Hornets dive for the deck to evade the incoming S-400 interceptors. Most of the interceptors target decoys, however, and the non-evasive decoys are blown out of the sky. Shortly after, AIM-120s pounce on the incoming Russian fighters, forcing them to break off their supersonic sprints or be blown to pieces. The intense air battle has provided cover for two more pieces on the chessboard. From the direction of Kherson, Ukrainian MiG-29s and Su-27s pop up from treetop height, exposing themselves to S-400 radar. However, a volley of Magnum calls over the radio heralds the deployment of a volley of high-speed anti-radiation missiles. The Russians realize what's happening and quickly power down their radar, allowing the Ukrainian aircraft to break off without being fired on. But the harm missiles don't just ride radio wave beams back to their target, they can memorize the direction of incoming radar energy and find the source with great accuracy. The Russians are forced to power down their air defense radars across west and south of Crimea, but the harm still managed to find multiple radar sets, destroying them. The rest miss their targets and self-destruct in flight. A B-2 aircraft equipped with high-speed ground attack missiles has used the chaos inflicted by the decoys and harm attack to slip near the peninsula. Its weapon bays open and 16 large missiles drop out of the rotating magazines in quick succession. 
The joint air-to-surface standoff missiles fire their rocket motors and rip toward their target. As air defense radars power back on, the B-2 is detected, but it's too far away to be targeted. Russian fighters who might have been able to close the distance and value the high-priority target have been destroyed or chased off by the F-35s, giving the subsonic stealth bomber plenty of time to fly to safety. Short-range air defense batteries come to life at the western edge of the Kirk Bridge as a volley of fire and missiles rise up to intercept the attack. However, the deployment via B-2 has allowed the missiles to be detected with a far lesser engagement range than air defense would normally have against non-stealthy missiles. Incoming fire downs the first six missiles. A second volley smacks another five missiles out of the sky. Now radar-guided cannon fire blasts the night sky, taking out another missile. Four, however, survive and each deliver a 1,000-pound warhead straight into the structural supports on the infamous Kirk Bridge. The all-important rail segment collapses under its own weight while the motor vehicle section only partially collapses. However, with the motorway dangerously leaning down into the waves below, it won't be used by vehicle traffic for weeks if the Russians get a chance to fix it at all. Day 32, 1532 local, outskirts of Melitopol. The combined American-Ukrainian assault initially fainted toward Polohi before suddenly hooking south and taking Tokmak. The depth of this penetration attack is only limited by the lack of American ground power, which is slowly trickling into the theater. American air power, however, is in full effect, harassing the Russian air defense network daily and slowly grinding it out of existence. In another two to three weeks, it's predicted the U.S. will have air superiority. Shortly after that, air dominance. The push south now breaks the suburbs of Melitopol, the ferocity of the initial penetration and exploitation rocking the Russians on their heels. Every time they attempt to gather a significant armor force to counterattack, it comes under harassment from long-range precision rocket and artillery fire or standoff attack weapons fired from American aircraft. It's only safe to gather men and vehicles together in ever-shrinking air defense pockets. The Big Abrams lead the charge of two combined brigade combat teams. The American tanks are doing the job they were born to do, taking on Russian armor on the battlefields of Europe. Thankfully for all involved, the battlefields so far remain non-nuclear. The President of the United States has made it clear that this is an operation to liberate Ukraine, not take Russian territory. Any nuclear provocation will immediately be met in kind. Russia's problems are compounding by the day. U.S. doctrine utilizes deep strikes with standoff weapons and stealth platforms to harass and interrupt the enemy's rear assets. Special forces launch raids against priority targets, everything from air defense sites to supply notes. The U.S. Army's air cavalry is taking significant losses and its use has had to be heavily curtailed, but the U.S. Air Force picks up the slack even if they can't quite match the speed of close air support that an attack helicopter can offer. Russian morale, already weak when fighting against under-equipped Ukrainian forces, is now in crisis mode. The widespread use of overwhelming numbers of precision weapons, combined with the shock and awe of U.S. combined arms operations, is leading to collapses across wide stretches of the front. Many conscripts are starting to take their chances of being shot in retreat by their own forces rather than stand and fight against the combined U.S.-Ukrainian offensive. What the Russians don't know is that the U.S. has gone all in on the initial assault, and soon it'll take weeks to replenish its stockpile of advanced weaponry from reserves. However, the Kirk Bridge has been destroyed, and now the thrust into Melitopol threatens to cut off the Crimean Peninsula from Russia. This will be a strategic disaster for the Russian armed forces, for whom retreat from the peninsula is already too late. An amphibious assault is impossible given that Turkey has refused to allow any U.S. ships to enter the Black Sea itself. This will allow Russia to concentrate its defenses in the north of the peninsula, where its artillery can cover the narrow approaches from the mainland with overwhelming firepower. However, the U.S. advantage in precision long-range strike capabilities means that Russia's trump card, its overwhelming numbers of artillery, matters less and less each day. Shell starvation is also quickly becoming a major issue, especially as resupply is now only possible via small boats. There's a new military superpower dawning on the European continent, and no, it's not France, Germany, or even Britain. Poland has decided it's done messing around, and it's arming itself to the teeth. But why is Poland apparently preparing itself for World War III? Russia's invasion of Ukraine has served as an alarm bell for a Europe that, for three decades, was content to let the United States do all its military heavy lifting while naturally complaining endlessly about U.S. militarization. However, the explosion of war in its backyard has snapped European powers out of their comfortable post-Cold War victory naps, and suddenly the continent has remembered there is a serious military threat right next door, and America is still an ocean away. Forget the baguettes and berets, it's time to start buying guns again. 
but Europe can hardly be blamed for dropping the ball on their own defensive spending. After decades of being prepared to wage an apocalyptic battle for global survival, the West breathed a collective sigh of relief, and billions of dollars in military spending was repurposed to civilian projects. Armies were demobilized, budgets were slashed, and a lot of military kit was either thrown into deep storage or donated to developing countries. With the rise of extremism, European militaries focused on waging small regional conflicts with logistics handled almost entirely by the US. The next major war would be one with hugs, or simply not fought at all, as Europe tried to bring Russia into the fold by deepening trade relations with their cranky neighbor. Yet all Europe managed to do was give Russia incredible leverage over them, because Russia wasn't done fighting wars to advance its national agenda. When war broke out in Ukraine, Europe was caught with its pants down, and despite having a combined GDP many times greater than Russia, they cannot outsupply Russia inside Ukraine. Poland was quick to take note though, and overnight the country went on a dizzying shopping spree for all kinds of new military kit. Poland has good reason to want to buy absolute mountains of new tanks and other gear, and that's not an exaggeration. Had Russia's invasion of Ukraine been planned by anyone more competent, Poland could have found itself at ground zero of a new military struggle for Europe, and the major European powers could have done little if anything to help the nation. Britain has been in decline as a military power for decades now, with its military shrinking to half of its size at the end of the Cold War. As an island nation, Britain's most important capability is its ability to send expeditionary forces abroad. And yet, during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the British military got the nickname the Borrowers for their tendency of bartering for pieces of kit that they were missing. Meanwhile, their navy's been in significant decline, with their ships having to be in effect mothballed so their crews can be used elsewhere. In 2021, Britain's Parliamentary Defense Committee delivered a scathing report outlining significant problems with the Royal Navy, including a critical lack of offensive capability and too few surface ships and submarines. Germany's facing its own significant issues. Main its problems, from a lack of qualified technicians as well as spare parts, has meant that German pilots aren't getting the number of hours in the cockpit they need to remain proficient. The country is also incapable of meeting NATO's rapid response requirements without cannibalizing other units, leaving it in serious risk of being incapable of fighting a protracted conflict. France is about the only European power to maintain a significant military capability. We actually have little to criticize about France, except that its expeditionary capabilities are slightly lacking, but experience gained in counterterrorism operations in Africa is helping to rectify the problem. We're not picking on Europe unfairly, though. The simple fact is, the continent has been coasting on the back of the US military for decades. The Royal Navy prioritized retiring logistics vessels as a cost-saving measure. Why? because any conflict they foresaw fighting would involve the United States and its massive logistics capabilities. Germany retired much of its ground-based air defenses. Why? Because any war it would be involved in would have assumed air superiority largely thanks to the United States. Since the Cold War ended, Europe evolved into a power that would complement US warfighting abilities rather than be a battlefield force on its own. Given the fact that Europe's favorite historical pastime was mercilessly slaughtering each other for thousands of years, this might not have been such a bad thing. Poland has seen which way the wind's blowing, and that it cannot rely on its European allies for national defense. The US military is the most powerful in the world, but it's also half a planet away. And if history is anything to go by, and it absolutely is if you're Poland, then by the time the US Army arrives in Europe in force, Poland would already be a battleground. Perhaps no nation in the world is as cursed as Poland, which has historically served as a convenient middle ground for major European armies to batter each other to pieces. That's because the nation has basically no defensive geographical features, allowing invaders to just casually stroll right on in at their leisure. Poland is done being Europe's punching bag and is aiming to field the most capable military inside of Europe. Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki spoke to the nation on the eve of its Independence Day, stating the Polish army must be so powerful that it does not have to fight due to its strength alone. Judging by the amounts of weapon orders it's been putting in, this is far more fact than wishful thinking. Poland is raising its defensive spending from 2.4% of their GDP to a whopping 5%. This is more than even the United States. It also puts other NATO partners to shame who have largely struggled to meet the bare minimum requirement set by the alliance of 2%. This is a long-term commitment too, as the country is determined to double the size of its military by 2035, from 150,000 to 300,000. Those troops are gonna need combat gear though, and Poland is buying it in spades. In exchange for sending 240 Soviet-made tanks to Ukraine, the US cut Poland a deal for 250 Abrams, a significant upgrade to its land forces, but the nation was 
is paying very close attention to the fighting in Ukraine and has made a direct bid to Lockheed Martin to buy around 500 HIMARS units. This was an incredible order and would have made Poland as big an operator of HIMARS as the United States. Unfortunately, the US was itself procuring units to replace those sent to Ukraine and to make even more available to the country. Given that the war in Ukraine has been basically one giant commercial for Lockheed Martin, it's no surprise that other nations were already in line to buy the vaunted guided rocket artillery, even with the US wishing to beef up its own numbers. With the US in effect sold out for the foreseeable future, Poland turned to South Korea for its guided rocket artillery need, signing an order for 288 Chunmu platforms. Similar to HIMARS, only beefier, the Chunmu can carry twice as many rockets as HIMARS, though at the cost of mobility. With a significant standing army in the works, though, Poland believes the trade-off is worth it. Its rocket artillery will have to do less hiding thanks to major investments in other areas of its military. This includes the Air Force, with Poland signing an agreement to buy 32 F-35s. But Poland shocked the world when it once more returned to South Korea for multiple military purchases, in effect sourcing almost all of its new purchases from the nation. Purchases include a fleet of 48 F-A-50s. These are meant to replace its aging fleet of MiGs and will complement its inventory of F-16s and soon F-35s. While Poland won't have a major air force anytime soon, it's well on its way to being a significant threat to Russia should it ever make the mistake of crossing into its airspace. Beefing up its traditional tube artillery, Poland is also buying 648 K-9 howitzers from South Korea. This will make Poland one of, if not the biggest artillery power in Europe aside from Russia, especially when coupled with its purchase of 288 Chunmu MLRSs. By far the highest profile item on Poland's shopping list though, and one that has really annoyed its neighbor, is the purchase of nearly 1,000 K-2 main battle tanks. The K-2 was originally designed by South Korea and is believed to be a highly capable modern tank. Its real capabilities are unknown though, as the tank has never seen combat and the South Korean government isn't in a hurry to make classified data public. Most observers, however, have full confidence in the K-2, though Russian defense analysts are puzzled by the design decision to not have the tank launch its crew into orbit upon taking a hit from an anti-tank missile. The main concern raised by Poland's purchase power, however, is that the K-2 was specifically built for a war South Korea expected to fight on its relatively hilly terrain, a far cry from the flat European plain. How the K-2 will fare here is anyone's guess, and hopefully we'll never have to find out. Poland's South Korea spending spree has made the two countries absolutely chummy, and that's something that's really annoyed the rest of Europe. Home to many great tank manufacturers, Europe is frankly puzzled at Poland's decision to purchase tanks from a nation half a world away, especially when its logistics will depend on easily disrupted supply routes that literally span the planet. But the decision makes a lot of sense if South Korea plans to break into the global arms market and if the nation builds maintenance facilities inside of Poland itself, this will secure Poland's logistics needs and open the door to the European arms market for South Korea, a deal that benefits both sides. Germany has famously been the United States' most important European ally, but now Germany has become nothing more than a logistics hub for the American military. With the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, Poland has now become America's most important European ally, and the relationship was cemented by US officials commenting on that fact. Perhaps unsurprising given its proximity to Russia, Poland was the loudest voice calling for Europe to aid Ukraine and threw its doors open to Ukrainian refugees. Its airfields and transport networks were immediately made available to the US and other foreign aid flowing into Ukraine. And when a Ukrainian air defense missile landed in Poland and killed several people, the nation put the blame squarely on Russia for necessitating the launch of said missile by Ukraine in the first place. Given Poland's history and tenuous strategic position in Europe, it's no surprise that it's incredibly invested in the outcome of the war in Ukraine. What is surprising, however, is the incredible speed with which the country has moved to bolster its defenses and the willingness to work with the United States to arm Ukraine. Given its position inside of Europe and the military capabilities it will soon field, it's easy to see why Poland will soon trump the rest of the European powers as America's most important ally in the region. What remains to be seen, however, is if the nation will go through with all of its planned purchases, especially if the war in Ukraine ends sooner than expected and the Polish population grows weary of the incredible price tags of some of these weapons. With tensions skyrocketing in Ukraine, a confrontation between the United States and Russia is more likely than ever. But what would that look like, and how do these two military heavyweights compare? 
If Russia and the US come to blows, anyone caught in their way better make sure not to get underfoot of these two military titans. The US remains the world's premier military superpower, but Russia holds fast to the number two spot, just barely edging out over China's rising star. In Russia, crippling sanctions over the annexation of Crimea have bled Russia dry for almost a decade and been an absolute economic disaster for the nation. Not only is the Russian economy critically weakened, but sanctions and stagnation have led to a slow but steady brain drain of Russian talent out of the country. Russian professionals, entrepreneurs, academics, and artists are all migrating out of the country and seeking better opportunities in Europe or the US. The lack of a diversified economy is a crippling vulnerability for Russia, and the global fall in oil prices has only made economic woes even worse for the nation. This has directly translated into a sharp decline in military capabilities, as budgets shrink and planned replacements for aging equipment fail to materialize. Slowly but surely, the gap in technological capabilities between Russia and the US is growing. The United States has its own financial woes, seeing the worst inflation it's seen in 40 years. With interest rate hikes coming in 2022, the American economy is sure to feel the pinch as investors tighten their purse strings. However, the American economy remains strong and well diversified, leaving it far less vulnerable to economic disruption than Russia, whether that disruption comes from social change, technology, or war. But what do the numbers say about a possible war between the two heavyweights? Population matters in a prolonged war. Without population, there are no reinforcements, and an economy is far more vulnerable to mass conscription and casualties. The United States has a population of 334,998,000 versus Russia's 142,321,000, giving the US over a 2 to 1 advantage in population. However, that's only part of the story, because Russia's aging population only makes its disadvantages even worse in comparison to the US. The US has approximately 147,399,000 conscripts potentially available to fight a brutal multi-year conflict, while Russia only has 69,737,000. Of those potential conscripts, though, approximately 122,274,000 are fit for combat duty in the US, while in Russia only 46,681,000 potential recruits are fit for combat. Every year, 4.4 million American youth reach military age, but Russia's population crisis sees only 1.3 million youth reach military age. Both nations are experiencing a decline in birth rates, with the US birth rate at 1.70 and Russia's at 1.50. This is below the 2.1 birth rate required to sustain a population, but the United States continues a positive population growth thanks to healthy amounts of immigration. Russia, on the other hand, is experiencing a population decline. In simple terms, if the two powers engage in a mass casualty conflict that spans multiple years, Russia will be bled dry long before the US is. A modern war, however, will likely be too fast and brutal for population trends to determine a winner, even if it doesn't turn nuclear. That's why what might matter most is the number of personnel both countries can muster within months of hostilities starting. The United States enters a potential conflict with a military of 1.39 million strong, while Russia maintains an active duty force of 850,000. The difference is staggering, with the US military almost twice as big as the Russian military, giving the US an immediate numerical advantage. Another advantage the US enjoys is a professional all-volunteer fighting force. While Russia has had to cancel plans to transition to an all-volunteer force due to economic woes and shrinking budgets, however, Russia has come a long way from when its military was staffed primarily by conscripts, and today only about 30% of the Russian military is conscripted, or about 225,000. The disadvantage is still significant, though. A professional all-volunteer military is more likely to retain highly trained individuals who over time transition into senior leadership positions. This fills the upper echelons of an all-volunteer force with seasoned veterans who make all the difference in combat operations. A conscripted military, however, struggles greatly to retain individuals over the long term, leading to veterancy issues and a lack of well-tested command corps. There's no direct way to measure the advantage of an all-volunteer military versus a partially conscripted one, but throughout history, volunteer soldiers routinely outperform conscripted soldiers, which is what made mercenaries so attractive to world powers throughout most of human history. The United States thus enjoys another advantage over Russia, though that advantage has shrunk due to Russia's growing professional military. A critical component of any army, though, is the strength of its reserve force, especially in modern high-intensity warfare that can see regular forces quickly rendered combat ineffective. The United States maintains a significant reservist force of 442,000 personnel versus Russia's 250,000. In terms of reservists, the US enjoys both an advantage in numbers and training. American reservists receive regular training and even partake in combat deployments, 
making their competency comparable to many nations' regular forces. This is not an accident, but rather by design. The United States keenly understands that in a modern high-intensity conflict, it will face significant initial losses and is prepared to mitigate this loss in capabilities via a strong reserve force. By comparison, Russian reservist training has been historically spotty at best. Efforts to retain veteran soldiers with reservist contracts hopes to counteract a critical lack of training, but at the moment the Russian reserves simply pale in comparison to American reserves and capabilities. A lack of training also extends to the Russian regular forces as well. Though great leaps have been made to increase the readiness of combat troops, large exercises however are not cheap and can produce a great deal of wear and tear on equipment, something that is a critical concern for a Russian army fielding aging equipment and with a limited budget. Thus, while the Russian forces have undergone an increase in military drills in the last decade, they still fail to match the training tempo of their American counterparts. The Russian air forces have also seen a dramatic reduction in training, with most pilots flying only between 100 and 120 hours per year. The United States was matching this rate until 2019 when it pushed for an increase to an average of 200 hours per year. Aging military aircraft in both militaries is directly leading to skyrocketing maintenance expenses, and flight hours are threatened with further reduction for both militaries. Big buys of F-35 and 4.5 generation F-15 and F-18s by the US, though, seeks to replace its aging fleet, which has an average age of 28 years. Russia, on the other hand, is procuring jets at a much slower rate. The US spends $770 billion on its military, while Russia spends $154 billion. While adjusted for purchasing power parity, though, the Russian defense budget is closer to $170 billion. Given that Russia buys much of its equipment from its native defense contractors, the US still retains a massive advantage, but not as large as one might think, given that salaries and benefits are much more expensive for the US than for Russia. Still, in sheer value, the United States purse is exponentially deeper than the Russian war purse, leading to a much greater proliferation of hardware. In the air, the United States fields a fleet of 13,247 aircraft, over three times as large as Russia's air fleet of 4,173. America's fighter fleet is over twice as large as Russia's, with 1,957 fighter aircraft versus Russia's 772. Both US and Russia have nearly the same number of attack aircraft, with 783 versus 739, though this is only because the United States prefers multi-role aircraft over dedicated attack platforms. A significant technological advantage in munitions allows even non-attack aircraft in the US fleet to effectively carry out air-to-sea or air-to-ground strike missions, while Russia struggles with a lack of smart weapons and support platforms for said weapons. This disparity in numbers and capabilities means that the United States Air Force and Navy aren't just better positioned to secure air supremacy, but to exploit it with devastating fire support missions against Russian ground targets, though American air supremacy will still have to contend with one of the world's best air defense forces. Knowing that it can't match America in the skies, Russia has historically put a lot of weight behind ground-based air defenses, creating some of the most advanced air defense systems in the world. It's assumed, then, that Russian ground forces will operate under the cover of their ground-based air defense assets, seriously threatening the survival of American attack platforms. However, due to a need to operate under this umbrella of safety, Russian ground forces would be unable to rapidly maneuver, potentially leaving the decisive advantage of momentum in the US hands. In a defensive mode, however, Russian ground forces would be incredibly difficult for the US to break if it was denied its air power by robust air defenses. Mobility is incredibly important in modern warfare. And here the US shines with the largest air and sea mobility fleet in the world. The US operates 982 transport aircraft versus Russia's 445, giving it a decisive advantage in quickly maneuvering troops and equipment in theater. The US's focus on a large mobility fleet, though, is a matter of necessity. Just like the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans both make the United States invulnerable to invasion by any power on Earth, it is just as a big barrier for American troops needing to get to the front. As Russia lacks any capability whatsoever to threaten the US with a land invasion, a conflict between the two would be indubitably playing out in Eastern Europe, necessitating the rapid movement of troops and supplies from America to Europe. Once in theater, though, the American air mobility fleet will make it an agile force capable of quickly exploiting opportunities, which can just as quickly replenish losses. One area of air power where the US absolutely dominates Russia or any other world power, though, is in the number of special mission aircraft. These highly specialized platforms are critical for the success of a modern combined arms military and run the gamut from airborne early warning to maritime patrol aircraft to electronic warfare platforms. These aircraft can be everything from eyes in the sky to specialized platforms that listen in on or jam enemy communications 
and are critical for modern high-tech warfare. Here, the United States fields a whopping 774 special mission platforms versus Russia's 132, putting the logistical, intelligence, and technological advantage firmly on the U.S. side. Attack helicopters are absolutely critical for supporting any ground offensive, and the U.S. operates 366 more of these platforms than Russia, with 910 versus 544. Russia operates three main attack helicopters, the Kamov Ka-50 Black Shark, the Mi-24 Hind, and the Mil Mi-28. The U.S. operates the AH-64 Apache and the AH-6M Little Bird. With a focus on special operations, the AH-6M Little Bird provides an extremely agile air support asset for soldiers in dense urban areas, while the U.S. Army's Apache is designed to destroy enemy armor and provide direct fire support for American infantry. The Russian attack helicopter fleet represents the shifting of priorities and ideologies between its years as the Soviet Union and its modern life as the Russian Federation. The Hind is a heavy fire support platform with the capacity to ferry up to eight fully equipped troops into combat while the Ka-50 and the Mi-28 represent a more traditional attack helicopter design. Tanks make up the backbone of any modern army, and here both nations shine. The United States has a tank force of 6,612 platforms versus Russia's 12,420. It appears that Russia enjoys a 2 to 1 advantage over the US in the tank arena, but the truth is that Russia inflates the size of its armored forces by counting units kept in storage as part of its active force. In reality, Russia operates closer to 3,000 tanks, with 9,000 mothballed and in reserve. Not only would these tanks require weeks for them and their crews to be prepared for combat, but most are Cold War relics with extremely questionable survivability on a modern battlefield. As Stalin once put it though, quantity is a quality all its own, though Stalin never lived to see the blistering speed and overwhelming firepower of modern anti-tank platforms. The bulk of Russian tank forces is the T-72, which has received modernity upgrades alongside its M1 Abrams American counterpart. However, pound for pound, the Abrams continues to outclass the T-72. While most comparisons of the Abrams capabilities rely on the shocking display of overwhelming superiority against Iraq's T-72s, this is a grossly unfair comparison. For starters, export models of Russian T-72s are not nearly as capable as those fielded by the Russian army. Secondly, Russian tank crews are overwhelmingly better trained than their Iraqi counterparts in Desert Storm. The Abrams, however, is still the better tank in 2022 with armor, sight, and electronics upgrades integrated into the active tank force on a consistent basis. Russia, on the other hand, has struggled to keep its own tank forces fully modernized. The one advantage that the T-72 enjoys over the Abrams is its ability to fire anti-tank missiles from its barrel, though doing so requires the T-72 to stand still while guiding its missile to target, during which an Abrams could simply scoot out of the way or kill the T-72. Both Russia and the U.S. place a strong emphasis on mechanized infantry, with the U.S. fielding 45,193 armored vehicles versus Russia's 30,122. While this leaves the U.S. better able to replenish losses, Russia still fields enough armored vehicles to provide ample mobility and protection to its infantry. In a battle of attrition, though, the numbers favor the U.S. There is one area, however, where Russia dominates not just the United States, but the entire world, and that's artillery. It's said Russia can field enough artillery that if it all fired at once, you'd feel the explosions on the other side of the world. And the numbers are truly astonishing. Russia absolutely dwarfs the US in numbers of self-propelled artillery, with 6,574 platforms versus America's 1,498. The story remains the same for traditional artillery, with 7,571 howitzers versus the US's 1,339. Russia also enjoys a 3 to 1 advantage in rocket artillery with 3,391 units versus the US's 1,366. The difference is a product of both geography and priorities. Russia has traditionally had to be concerned with fighting a massive land battle in either Europe against NATO or Asia against China. The nation has also had to contend with the reality that in battle against its greatest competitor, the United States, it could not count on air platforms to provide fire support for frontline troops. Facing off against a technologically superior foe, Russia placed an emphasis on sheer firepower. Superior American Abrams tanks don't matter much if they can't advance due to withering barrages of Russian artillery. The US, however, has by necessity shifted most of its fire support capabilities to more mobile airborne platforms. As it faces no threat of invasion or major conflict on its own continent, mobility is more important for the United States military. With a greater focus on technology, mobility, and smart munitions, airborne fire support simply makes more sense to the U.S. military than masses of artillery that need to be transported thousands of miles to any conflict zone. 
American air-based fire support is far superior even to Russia's masses of artillery on delivering effective fire on target, but only if Russian air defenses can be neutralized. Otherwise, American soldiers might find themselves completely overwhelmed by the world's largest artillery corps. At sea, Russia operates a larger fleet than the United States, with 605 ships versus America's 484. However, the capabilities of America's Navy far surpass those of the Russian Navy, which has historically been the least important of its military branches. Funding priorities reflect this, and today the Russian Navy is in a state of serious decline, operating largely Cold War-era equipment that rarely sees upgrades. The United States currently operates 11 aircraft carriers, with its carrier air forces by themselves larger than most nations' entire air fleets. Russia, by comparison, operates only one, and operates is a term we're using rather loosely here, as the Admiral Kuznetsov is infamous for breakdowns. A remnant of the Cold War, the Kuznetsov is in a perpetual state of disrepair and would be incapable of posing even a moderate threat to US forces before it was destroyed. However, America's mighty carrier fleet is its own vulnerability, with Russia having developed hypersonic anti-ship missiles that present a lethal risk to American naval power. Currently, the United States has no defense against these weapons, except to attack and degrade Russian kill chain assets such as radar tracking installations, communication nodes, and satellites. The United States also operates nine smaller carriers to support amphibious assault operations, while Russia completely lacks this capability. Amphibious operations would likely not play a big role in a US-Russian conflict, but with the ability to fly the F-35, these many carriers would only complicate matters for the Russian Air Force and Navy. Russia does outnumber the US in numbers of submarines, with the US operating 68 versus Russia's 70. However, modernity is an issue with Russia's submarine fleet, and it's unknown how many subs Russia can actually put to sea in case of a war, given the state of poor logistics in the Russian Navy. By comparison, the United States submarine fleet is being steadily upgraded with the acquisition of the Virginia-class attack submarine and are on the whole more capable than Russian boats. The United States outnumbers Russia in numbers of destroyers, with 92 guided missile destroyers versus Russia's 15. While outnumbered and outgunned by major combatants, Russia has a far greater fleet of smaller vessels, which could pose a serious threat if massed together or used to harness U.S. supply lines. Russia has also mounted its caliber cruise missiles on civilian vessels, meaning that any Russian ship could be a potential deadly threat to an unwary American vessel. On the whole, the American military is larger and more capable than the Russian military in 2022. However, Russia has achieved a breakthrough in hypersonic weapons that the US has yet to match and has even begun to press those weapons into service. This gives Russia a decisive advantage at the opening of any major hostilities, though its weak economy means that the nation can't fully capitalize on this advantage by fielding hypersonic missiles in significant numbers. This is a trend that tracks all across the board and has repeated itself with the Su-57 fifth-generation fighter and the T-14 Armata tank. Both of these weapon platforms present deadly threats to their US counterparts, but due to a lack of funding, Russia has been forced to postpone any significant purchases for years, if ever. Today, Russia faces a modernity crisis as its legacy forces are being rapidly outclassed technologically by potential rivals. The United States has its own technological problems, however, and over-reliance on technology might become a critical vulnerability for the US military should its satellite or command and control networks be compromised. An addiction to technology by the United States has also led to a legacy of weapons acquisitions in the post-2000s that is, frankly, catastrophic. Funneling billions upon billions into moonshot after moonshot, the United States has failed to bring few of its new weapon systems in the last 20 years to full maturity. The F-35's capabilities are still so in question that both the US Navy and Air Force purchased significant amounts of F-15s and F-18s to compensate for the potential crisis. The Zumwalt destroyer and littoral combat ships were both complete boondoggles that cost billions and left the US Navy high and dry. The failure of the Future Force Warrior program left the US Army with few working technologies and a massive waste of taxpayer money. A focus on technological moonshots has eroded the United States' technological advantage significantly, and today the American military is in desperate need of new weapons platforms that cannot just match but outcompete those being developed or already in service with the armies of China and Russia. Entire swaths of the American Midwest are obliterated. Washington, D.C., London, and Berlin are decimated in fiery explosions. A quiet rural town in upstate Maine is annihilated. In a matter of minutes, 50 million people will die. If Russia ever launched any nukes, many of its targets would be within the 3.797 million square miles or 9.834 million square kilometers that make up the United States. This is because the US has the most powerful military in the world 
and is the only country with a nuclear arsenal that rivals Russia's own. Therefore, as we examine key locations Russia would target, we'll start in the United States and then zoom out to the world as a whole. There are very few parts of the US that would be safe from destruction if Russia launched a nuclear strike. There would also be very little the US could do to stop the missiles from striking their targets as they would descend in overwhelming numbers. New intel identifies some of the first areas that will be targeted by Russian nukes, and they are not where you might expect. The question is, will you be safe? We're going to dive right into the key targets that Russia will strike, but before we do so, let's look at how we know who will be in danger. This year, Putin announced that he'll suspend Russia's participation in the New START nuclear weapons treaty. The treaty was agreed upon in 2011 in hopes of reducing the number of nuclear weapons around the world. However, now that Putin's declared this country will no longer abide by the START treaty, he can increase the stockpile of 5,889 nukes Russia already has. Only 1,588 of these nuclear weapons are currently deployed. But if Putin's preparing for nuclear war, this could quickly change. Regardless, having over 1,500 active nuclear warheads is more than enough to decimate every US and NATO target on the globe. This is why when Putin said, to defend Russia and our people, we doubtlessly will use all weapons resources at our disposal, this is not a bluff, it was a serious cause for concern for the West. Currently, Russia has the most nuclear weapons out of any other country, with the United States following closely behind with around 5,244 nukes. Although it should be noted that the US is still trying to decommission and lower the number of nuclear warheads it has, while many nuclear countries are increasing their stockpiles, just like Russia. Some of the locations that will be targeted are easier to predict than others, but if we listen to what Putin has said in the past, he has blatantly stated where the nukes will be aimed. While talking to the Russian people on national television, Putin discussed a new hypersonic missile that could travel five times faster than the speed of sound at 3,836 miles per hour, or 6,173 kilometers per hour. He claimed this missile could be fitted with a nuclear warhead. The weapon likely doesn't exist in any type of working fashion, but in the announcement, Putin proclaimed it would be used to strike the Pentagon, Camp David, Jim Creek Naval Radio Station, Fort Ritchie, and McClellan Air Force Base. These are all military targets, which makes sense if Russia were to launch nukes. Let's start by looking at what other military targets Russia will go after if war breaks out before getting into the major cities, towns, and other locations that a Russian nuclear attack could target. Like the US, Russia has nuclear warheads that vary in yield. We'll analyze the destructive power of the RT-2PM Topol with a yield of 800 kilotons, one of Russia's most common nukes in its arsenal. Later on, we'll examine what would happen if Russia used some of its highest yield nukes and the massive amount of death and destruction it would cause. Let's start with the Pentagon. As we know, this will be one of the main targets for Russia. The Pentagon is the headquarters for the Department of Defense in the US. By destroying it, Russia would deal a significant blow to the US's military command structure. This would not fully cripple the US military, but it would cause a disruption in the leadership of the country. The other problem with Russia hitting the Pentagon with a nuke is that it would destroy much of Washington, D.C., the capital of the nation. There are around 713,000 people living in D.C., with more than 6,385,000 living in the greater D.C. area. That means if a nuke goes off over the Pentagon, it will kill around 420,000 people in the initial blast. Estimates put the number of total injured close to 861,500. The fireball caused by the nuclear explosion would vaporize the Pentagon and anything within a half-mile radius. The blast damage would extend four miles out from the epicenter, which would mean most of Washington's legislative buildings and monuments would be destroyed or severely damaged. When looking at the images of the nuclear explosions that we provide in this video, keep in mind that the innermost circle closest to the epicenter is the area that will be consumed in the fireball. So anything inside this circle will be effectively vaporized. The bluish ring second from the epicenter signifies the area where the shock wave and air blast from the explosion will cause serious damage that could destroy buildings and cause flying debris, causing more death and injuries. The third yellowish colored ring signifies the area where the radiation would be so intense it could cause third degree burns. This is also true of all the areas before it and would also result in harmful mutations to people's DNA, which could lead to cancer. The last ring signifies the light blast damage that could also still lead to fatalities. Anyone in any of these circles that survived the initial blast would get a large dose of radiation and would likely die soon after. The White House is about 2.17 miles from the Pentagon, so if the president was there, he would be at risk of being killed by the high-intensity shockwave. Although Russia would likely launch a nuke dedicated to hitting the White House, so the point would be moot. As a result of the nuke hitting the Pentagon, 
thousands of government officials and their workers would be killed, the government would go into crisis mode, and almost all power would be immediately given to the president. If the president were killed in the blast, the next person in the line of succession would become the commander-in-chief, which in order would be the vice president, speaker of the house, president pro tempore of the senate, secretary of state, secretary of treasury, secretary of defense, and so on, until someone who was still alive could take over. Other than taking out the US Capitol, Russia would also need to destroy as many nuclear missile silos as possible in order to have any hope of surviving a retaliatory nuclear strike by the US. This tactic would not be 100% effective, as the United States has too many nukes of their own, a number of early warning systems, and nuclear missiles aboard submarines in unknown locations around the world. However, at the very least, Russia would need to take out as many US nuclear missile silos as possible in the first round of attacks. This means some pretty remote parts of the US would be targeted. If Russia was hoping to survive the next few hours, it would need to target all of the United States Minuteman III ICBM bases. The first one we'll look at is Malmstrom Air Force Base in the middle of Montana. Malmstrom has around 3,400 military personnel and about 1,000 civilians working on base. However, it's its 150 Minutemen III nuclear missiles that Russia would be aiming for. Putin would likely order several nukes to be launched at any high-priority targets, but just one would be devastating. Everyone on the base would be killed in the initial blast along with 15,000 people in the nearby towns of Black Eagle and Great Falls. The number of injured would be around twice as many. The population in the region isn't very dense, so the casualties wouldn't be nearly as high as a major city, but that isn't the objective of hitting Malmstrom Air Force Base. Russia would be only trying to cripple the military installation's ability to launch its Minuteman missiles back at their homeland. Unfortunately, upon detonation, the water flowing through the Missouri River near the blast site would immediately evaporate. The water further upstream would continue to flow and eventually pass through the irradiated landscape around Malmstrom. This water would then carry radioactive particles downstream and eventually into the Mississippi River. For weeks and even months, the contaminated water would not be safe to drink. Wildlife will die from radiation poisoning even if they're hundreds of miles away from the blast site. However, Malmstrom isn't the only military target on the list. A second key military base that Russia would target is Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. This installation also contains approximately 150 Minuteman missile silos. Minot itself doesn't have as many staff as Malmstrom, with only 3,200 military personnel and 420 civilian employees. However, the town of Minot itself is more populated than the area around Malmstrom. This means the number of casualties will be higher when the nuke detonates. The number of immediate casualties will be 23,300, with another 20,000 people suffering injuries from the air blast of the explosion. This entire region of the country is sparsely populated, so the fallout won't contaminate as many people as other regions. But again, the goal for these nukes is to render the US ICBMs in the area inoperable. The final military base that would be a must-strike location for Russia would be F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming. However, the Minuteman silos under its control are actually spread between Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska. This base also oversees around 150 missiles, with 3,360 military members and 964 civilians working at the location. Like with the other ICBM missile silos, more than one Russian nuke would be dedicated to the area. But even just one would cause around 26,600 deaths and 36,380 casualties. The town of Cheyenne would be decimated, and anyone there at the time of detonation would likely receive a lethal dose of radiation. Russia would also launch nukes at the US command and control targets across the country. Some of these locations are more well-known than others. In fact, you might be living near one and not even know it. The one obvious target would be North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, at Peterson Air Force Base. Unfortunately, this is just outside of Colorado Springs, a heavily populated area in the state. This means that when the nuke strikes the Air Force Base, it'll also decimate much of Colorado Springs. NORAD is a combined organization that includes the United States and Canadian employees who oversee aerospace warning, air sovereignty and protection for Canada, the continental US, and Alaska. Peterson Air Force Base and the surrounding area employs or is home to a large number of military service members and civilians who work at the base. In fact, there are over 8,750 active duty members, 1,325 reservists, 10,200 family members of the military, and 1,900 civilians in the area. This is on top of the over 23,000 veterans. This key target for Russia will cost the lives of over 60,000 people and injure close to 200,000. The eastern portion of Colorado Springs would be decimated, although people in the mountains to the west of the small city could be spared from much of the fallout as the wind would blow radioactive particles further east toward Kansas. 
Then there is Offutt Air Force Base, just outside Omaha, Nebraska. This is the headquarters of the United States' Strategic Command and would be a very important base for Russia to take out. The U.S. Strategic Command's mission is to deter strategic attack through a safe, secure, effective, and credible global combat capability and, when directed, is ready to prevail in conflict. So it's pretty obvious why Russia would want to destroy the headquarters of this organization. The nuclear warhead that struck off it would cause a serious breach in U.S. defenses. The blast would kill 40,000 people almost instantly and injure around 145,000 more. This is because over 32,000 military, civilian, contractors, dependents, and retirees call this area home, and Omaha is a city of around 500,000. Again, the waters of the Missouri River would quickly evaporate from the heat, and then the incoming water would be irradiated as it flowed toward the Mississippi. Strategic Command would be transferred to one of the other 10 combatant command sites in the U.S. to continue preparations for a retaliatory strike, although at this point the U.S. would have launched its own nuclear missiles already as it tried to wipe out as many Russian targets as possible. Another strategic location Russia could aim its nukes at would be rural Maine, almost near the border of Canada. It's here that the VLF transmitter Cutler is located. It's this station that transmits one-way communication to submarines in the U.S. Navy's Atlantic Fleet. These transmissions could reach vessels both on the surface and underwater. It transmits at 24 kilohertz with an input power of up to 1.8 megawatts. This means Cutler can only transmit text messages at a low data rate. The base will be an important target for Russia because it's this transmission base that will send launch codes and orders to U.S. submarines with nuclear capabilities in the Atlantic Ocean. By destroying this base, it'll be harder for U.S. command to contact these submarines. The casualties caused by the nuclear explosion at the VLF transmitter Cutler would be minimal due to its remote location. However, the ocean life and coastal ecosystems of the area will be completely destroyed. Cutler and the surrounding areas will suffer around 800 casualties from the nuclear blast, as the town itself only has a population of about 500. The counterpart to the VLF transmitter Cutler is the Jim Creek Naval Radio Station in Washington State. It's this facility that sends transmissions to the submarines in the Pacific Fleet. Obviously, this is another base the Kremlin would want to take out, so the U.S. couldn't send orders to its submarines off the east coast of Russia. However, like Cutler, the Jim Creek Naval Radio Station is in a remote area, so casualties due to the blast will be relatively low. An estimated 400 people would die in the immediate explosion, and another 10,000 or so would be injured. The forests of the region would be set ablaze and, depending on the weather, could burn for weeks. People who survived the blast would flee to the coast and seek shelter on islands just off the west coast of the state. However, the U.S. has another way to send messages to its Pacific fleet. Hawaii sits about 2,000 miles or 3,200 kilometers from the mainland of the U.S. On the island of Oahu is the Lualua Lei VLF transmitter, which also has the ability to send orders to the Pacific fleet, so Russia would also likely target this location as well. Hawaii may be one of the most remote island chains in the world, but Russian missiles launched from subs would still be able to reach its shores. Unlike Cutler and Jim Creek, Lualualei is a relatively populated area. Oahu is the most populous island in the Hawaiian island chain, with close to a million people on it at any given time. A chunk of these individuals are tourists, but Oahu has a decent-sized population on its own. That means if that the Lualualei VLF transmitter was hit with a nuclear bomb, it would decimate the population on the western part of the island. Anyone else on Oahu would likely get a huge dose of radiation as there would be nowhere to hide, and the ocean breeze would sweep radioactive particles and debris across the island. The immediate death toll would be around 18,500, with 76,000 more people injured. However, the fact that Oahu is also home to Pearl Harbor and a number of naval installations would mean this island would likely be hit with several nukes. All of the locations we've discussed thus far have been key military targets. The cumulative casualties as a result of nukes just hitting the locals would be in the hundreds of thousands. But if Russia were to launch a nuclear strike, they wouldn't just target military installations, they'd hit major cities as well. There would be too much at stake for them to leave major urban centers with large populations unharmed. For each American that wasn't killed in the initial nuclear strike, there would be another possible soldier that Russia would have to deal with down the road. This means there are definitely some key cities that would be targeted in the initial Russian nuclear strike. The scary part about these targets is that the casualty numbers would be much, much higher than anything we've seen thus far in the history of humanity. New York City is the financial capital of the United States, and perhaps the world. However, this will not stop Russia from targeting the island of Manhattan. A nuke detonating over New York would be disastrous. If Russia was trying to cripple the U.S., it would probably fire a nuke at the financial district in Lower Manhattan. To be fair, it doesn't really matter where a nuke hits in New York City, 
as the island of Manhattan is only around 13.4 miles long, yet with a population of 1.63 million. Very few people would be able to escape the blast of an 800 kiloton nuke. When the war had detonated, it would immediately kill around 1.5 million people. Another 3 million would be seriously injured from radiation burns or collapsed buildings. There were close to 8.5 million people in all five boroughs of New York City, and between the shockwave, the blinding flash of light, and the flying debris, everyone in the city would be affected. The medical infrastructure wouldn't be able to handle all the casualties, since a lot of major hospitals would have either been destroyed in the blast or severely damaged. Fires would rage through the city, while bridges, tunnels, and evacuation routes would become gridlocked or impassable. Another aspect of all nuclear explosions is that an electromagnetic pulse is released that would fry communication and electronic systems. High-tech medical equipment, computers, and cell phones would no longer work, and the city's power grid would go down. It would be like New York City was sent back to the 1700s, but this would not be the only city decimated by nuclear blasts if Russia decided to launch a nuclear attack. On the west coast, Los Angeles would also be a target. LA isn't as densely populated as New York City, but with a population of just under 4 million, the City of Angels would see a lot of death and destruction. When a nuke went off, it would annihilate pretty much all of downtown LA. It would kill over 500,000 people and injure 1.5 million more. According to the city, there are 5,484,606 automobiles, 123,669 motorcycles, and 1,068,213 commercial vehicles in LA. Those that were not incinerated by the fireball would be crashed by blinded drivers or hurtled across the landscape by the resulting air blast. The city already has water shortages, and the nuclear explosion would only make things worse. Miles of pipes would be rendered useless. What little water storage there was would be destroyed. People would flee the city but would find an inhospitable landscape all around them that was parched of liquid. The coastal winds would blow the radioactive smoke and soot inland, covering everything with a radiated fallout. In the middle of the country, Chicago and its 2.7 million residents would be a target as well. When the nuke detonated over the city, it would kill close to 600,000 people. Although, if downtown Chicago ended up being the epicenter of the blast, half the explosion and shockwave would extend into Lake Michigan, which could save the lives of many to the west of the city. However, even with part of the devastation being over water, over a million people would be injured in the blast. Between New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, the three most populated cities in the country would be obliterated. Washington, D.C. would definitely be hit, and many military installations would become nothing but craters with mushroom clouds rising up above them. Russia would need to go all in if it had any hope of destroying the U.S. in a nuclear war. In fact, Russia has enough nuclear warheads to hit major cities, urban areas, and every military base in the U.S. many times over. A map of targets in the U.S. would look something like this. So it's clear that no matter where you are in the US, chances are there would be a Russian nuke coming your way if Putin launched his entire arsenal. But it gets worse. Even if you were far away from all major cities or military targets, the radiation would still likely reach you from the fallout. As debris, smoke, and dust are kicked up into the atmosphere by a nuclear explosion, irradiated particles are carried long distances by the wind and then fall to the ground contaminating water, food, and the air. So really, the danger zones extend much further than just the major cities and military bases if Russia decides to launch nukes at the US. As you can see, people who live pretty much anywhere in the eastern United States will receive an unhealthy dose of radiation, which is really bad news, since around 80% of Americans live east of the Mississippi. The reason for that has a lot to do with climate and weather patterns, but that's a discussion for another video. What is important to know is that around 265.6 million people will either be killed, injured, or exposed to radioactive fallout in the US if Russia attacks with nukes. But what about the rest of the world? We focused a lot on the US because Russia could not hope to win a nuclear war without targeting the US and the thousands of nukes in its arsenal. Regardless of what the initial targets of a Russian nuclear attack were, mutually assured destruction is inevitable at this point. So Putin might decide not just to target the US, but major military bases across Europe as well. One main target would be the Allied Air Command in Rammstein, Germany. The purpose of this military installation is to lead NATO air and missile defense activities, including 24-7 air policing and monitoring of Alliance airspace. Therefore, if Russia was planning on launching nukes, this would be one of the targets outside of the US on the list. One main aspect of Allied Air Command's job is to monitor the skies for incoming missiles. This means that they'd be one of the first to know that Russia launched nukes, but it's unlikely there'd be enough time to evacuate people before the warhead started falling. When the nuke detonates over the Allied Air Command base, it would kill around 30,000 people in the blast. But firing nukes at Europe is a dangerous proposition, 
because there's a chance at least some of the fallout would be carried into Russia. But if Putin launches his entire nuclear arsenal, the fallout would be the least of anyone's worries. Like with the US, it's probable that Russia would launch nukes at some of the most populated cities in Europe as well. One target would undoubtedly be London, as the United Kingdom has over 200 nukes of its own. This means that the 8.8 .8 million people living in the English capital would be at great risk. A nuclear warhead that detonated over London would vaporize the entirety of the Parliament, Buckingham Palace, and many other government buildings which are concentrated in the center of the city. In the initial blast, 1 million people would die. In the following moments, another 2.3 million casualties would be caused by the shockwave. The only structures that would survive the nuke would be on the outskirts of the city. Like with New York City and other major urban areas we discussed so far, London would be set on fire and any hospitals would be completely overwhelmed. That is, if anyone could reach them and there were still staff alive to tend to the injured. Military and emergency personnel who were not caught in the multiple attacks across the UK would be deployed to urban areas where survivors would need the most help. Unfortunately for England and the surrounding regions, most of the islands would be subjected to nuclear fallout, although the coastal winds coming off the Atlantic could carry a lot of the radioactive particles that have been kicked up into the sky and out to the North Sea. No matter which part of the world or which way you look at it, Russian nukes being fired at any target is terrifying, but let's examine a couple of extreme circumstances. As you've seen, there would be more casualties in some places than others. But where would the most casualties occur from in a single nuclear strike? For this terrifying scenario, we'll have to go to one of the most densely populated cities in the world. The Philippines is an ally and defense partner of the US. In fact, it's one of the most important alliances the US has in Asia. Therefore, it's not out of the realm of possibility that Russia would fire nukes at the Philippine capital of Manila. Manila is one of the most densely populated cities on the planet. In 2020, it had 111,532 people per square mile or 43,062 people per square kilometer. However, this is just within the city. It's the metro area where things start to get really packed. The city of Manila has a population of around 1.8 million people. However, the Manila metro area has a population of close to 13.5 million people. The Manila metro area is about 239 square miles or 620 square kilometers. What this means is that the population density of Metro Manila is 56,485 people per square mile or 21,774 people per square kilometer. Remember that the fireball of an 800 kiloton nuke is about one square mile. When you consider just how densely packed the city and surrounding area are, things start to get out of hand very quickly. If a Russian nuke detonated over Manila, it would instantly kill about 2.1 million people. The casualties beyond that would be close to 5 million. The more dense a city is, the more death and destruction a nuke would cause. But there's another factor at play. Not all of Russia's nukes are 800 kilotons. Russia actually detonated the Tsar Bomba, the largest nuke in the history of the world, on October 30, 1961. This nuclear bomb had a yield of 50 megatons, which makes it over five times more powerful than the traditional nuclear warheads we've been discussing in our examples so far. Supposedly, the USSR only built one operational Tsar Bomba and two prototypes, but this cannot be confirmed as the Kremlin may have constructed more than are being stored somewhere in Russia. It's worth noting that Russia has several nuclear devices with yields between 1 and 50 megatons that it could fire at its enemies. But what if it were to drop a bomb similar in scale to the Tsar Bomba? What would that look like and what would happen? For this scenario, let's go back to New York City. Russia has modified a Tupolev Tu-160 supersonic heavy strategic bomber to drop a nuclear bomb the size of Tsar Bomba. The bomb falls toward the middle of Manhattan and detonates. Most of the island of Manhattan is vaporized by the fireball created by the massive explosion. The fireball extends 2.87 miles or 4.62 kilometers from the epicenter. The waters of the Hudson and East Rivers are immediately evaporated. The island of Manhattan and the surrounding area are nothing more than a smoldering crater turning the metropolis into hell on Earth. Heavy blast damage caused by the air burst from the detonation knocks over and damages buildings as far as 5.5 miles or 8.9 kilometers away. The concrete jungle of New York City that once had high rises extending over 1,000 feet into the air is now leveled like a windswept desert. The mushroom cloud from the explosion reaches 40 miles or 64 kilometers high. It can be seen from hundreds of miles away. Houses and older buildings as far as 12.8 miles or 20.7 kilometers from the detonation are knocked down, and thermal radiation with the intensity to cause third-degree burns is felt as far away as 37 miles or 60 kilometers. Moments after the 50 megaton nuke goes off, the death toll reaches 7.6 million people. In the coming days, more will succumb to radiation and trauma to their bodies. 
Somewhere around 12 million people will suffer some type of injury from the nuclear blast. The ground around the initial blast site will remain irradiated for up to five years. A 50 megaton nuke that is detonated over a city would cause more death and destruction in a few seconds than conventional weapons could cause in hours. Nuclear war is a terrifying thought that hopefully the world will never need to contend with. If Russia did attack any of the targets mentioned in the video with nukes, you can be sure that the US and its allies would retaliate. All the catastrophic mayhem we discussed would also be happening to Russian cities as well. In an all-out nuclear exchange between Russia and NATO, it's estimated that when the nukes stopped falling, the death toll would reach close to 100 million. However, this is just a small fraction of how many people would die as a result of the nuclear winter caused by this series of events. The war in Ukraine has proven one thing. The United States military would wipe the floor with Russia. No, we're not funded by the CIA, as many have claimed in the comments section. This is simple objective truth. Let's look at why. If you want to evaluate the capabilities of the two militaries, we must first understand the core philosophy of each fighting force. The Russian military has traditionally been a ground power with heavy focus on its army and artillery, with few warm water ports and almost none that would be immediately under threat from NATO forces, Russia and the Soviet Union before it held no illusions that they could become a major maritime power. Back when the US was fielding its first supercarriers, the Soviet Navy wanted to match the capability until they were reminded that to join the fight anywhere outside their immediate shoreline, they'd first have to run a gauntlet of NATO shore-based anti-ship missile batteries. Geography has not been kind to Russia's dreams of being a naval power, which is why it's never been a truly global power at all, period. This means that any future conflict involving Russia and NATO will most likely take place in Eastern Europe. The Russian military is well suited for that task, with the largest armored vehicle fleet in the world, which it has aggressively used to destroy Ukraine's stockpile of anti-tank missiles. Before the war in Ukraine, Russia had an estimated 170 battalion tactical groups, or about 119,000 ground combat troops, making it one of the largest ground forces in the world. It's in artillery where Russia truly shines, though, and it's been the only saving grace its military has been able to call upon. Before the war, Russia had over 10,000 artillery pieces and nearly 4,000 MLRS. Russia's reliance on artillery is not by accident. It knows full well that it cannot compete in the air against NATO powers and thus has relied on ground-based fire support to ensure it can provide support for engaged infantry and armor. However, as Ukraine has shown, these numbers are impressive on paper, but far less so when the actual equipment is taken into account as a significant bulk of this equipment is all from the Cold War and has not seen modernization upgrades. Also, a lot of it simply doesn't work anymore due to poor maintenance or storage or outright theft of critical components. Ultimately, Russia is a ground power meant to fight a war against the West and Europe. However, it's far from a modern professional military. Rampant corruption has hollowed out every single facet of the Russian war machine and made it an ineffective lumbering giant whose only real advantage is sheer mass. That works against a power like Ukraine, to a degree, but it would never work against the American military. America basically won the lottery when it came time to spawn on the world map. It's the single most defensible nation on Earth, quite literally immune to invasion from a hostile power thanks to two giant oceans on each coast and a complete domination of its global hemisphere. This defensive advantage came at a significant cost to project military power, America would need to first move that power thousands of miles east or west. And that's why the United States has always been a naval power since its creation as a state when it struggled against the vastly superior Royal British Navy during the Revolutionary War with a handful of boats we'll generously call warships. However, by the dawn of the 20th century, the United States Navy was rivaling the Royal Navy in tonnage and expertise and would surpass it in the interwar years as the most powerful naval force on Earth. This was all at the expense of its army, because when World War I and World War II kicked off, the US Army was a bit of a clown show. Enthusiastic almost to a fault, the British initially feared a total defeat in Africa when the US Army joined the fighting in World War II. However, under the tutelage of the Allied powers and cutting its teeth in combat, the US Army grew in proficiency. While its Marine Corps, a competent force throughout the early 20th century, would do some of the nastiest, dirtiest fighting on the planet against a fanatical enemy. America emerged from World War II with one clear lesson in mind, never again. Determined to be never second to any other power in the world, the US began to nurture what would become one of the most professional fighting forces in Earth's history. 
and to that end it became a technological power, putting its considerable intellectual and engineering resources into developing weapons one or more generations ahead of any potential adversary. In the second half of the 20th century, the United States shifted from a naval power to a naval and air power, unmatched in either arena, with a growing emphasis on air power. Engineers like the late great Kelly Johnson ensured that in the skies America had no peers. Modern Russian military doctrine gravitates around the Battalion Tactical Group, a formation of 600 to 800 combat troops made up of two to four companies of infantry, usually mechanized and reinforced with air defense, artillery, engineering, and logistical support units. A tank and a rocket artillery company are typically attached to each BTG. The BTG is meant to operate as a combined arms maneuver unit and has the advantage of allowing for the use of support assets such as artillery at the tactical level. A relative lack of infantry, though, with only about 200 infantrymen per BTG, means that it's difficult for this formation to actually hold territory, and the Russian army relies heavily on marines, paratroopers, or other units for the task. The fact that Russia is already looking to reorganize its BTGs is indicative of how well they perform against a near-peer adversary. Lessons learned in Ukraine are showing that the BTG is a more lumbering beast than agile tactical combined arms maneuvering unit. Though in truth, this probably has more to do with the quality of Russian soldiers, doctrine, and leadership than the composition of the BTG. One significant weakness of the Russian military is its ability to coordinate effectively. This has made the BTG a fundamentally flawed composition as it decentralizes Russia's greatest asset, its artillery. Unable to coordinate its massive advantage in artillery as big as 20 to 1 during the first 6 to 8 months of the war in Ukraine and 8 to 1 on average today, Russia has had far less success in leveraging its only real overmatch against the far smaller and less equipped Ukrainian military. British intelligence indicated that as of November 2022, Russia was already starting to move away from the BTG concept. The US Army's Brigade Combat Team is everything the battalion tactical group tried to be, and more. A BCT can come in four flavors – infantry, striker, armored, and strawberry lemonade. BCTs are meant to be fully self-supporting units and deployable anywhere in the world for any mission that the US Army requires of them. As such, they have various assets native to them. The infantry BCT is made up of about 4,500 soldiers and is organized around a core of three battalions of infantry. This already makes them significantly more powerful than Russia's BTG, as each battalion is made up of around 1,000 soldiers. However, this also means that the US fields far fewer BCTs than Russia fields BTGs with only 14 active BCTs in the US Army. American infantry is either mechanized or motorized, deployed in Bradley infantry fighting vehicles or using HMMWVs or their equivalent replacement, giving the BCT an emphasis on high mobility. Alongside its infantry, a BCT will typically contain one recon cavalry battalion, one brigade support battalion, one engineer battalion, and one field artillery battalion. A striker BCT is centered around the use of the striker armored vehicle, and is meant to plug a gap between the US Army's light infantry and heavy armored infantry. It's also meant to be a very fast response unit, with an entire brigade being airlifted anywhere in the world within 96 hours and a division within 120 hours. Like the infantry BCT, a striker BCT is made up of three infantry battalions in 300 striker vehicles, one recon cavalry battalion, one artillery battalion, one brigade support battalion, one brigade headquarters and headquarters company, and one brigade engineer battalion. An anti-tank company made up of the mobile gun system variant of the Striker directly supports the Striker BCT against enemy armor. The armored brigade combat team is what the US military sends when you've fudged around and it's time for you to find out. This is the armored fist of the American military, specifically designed to break the strongest of enemy defenses. The core of this formation is its 87 Abrams main battle tanks and 152 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles and an armored BCT can come in two varieties, with either two tank companies and one mechanized infantry company or two mechanized infantry companies and one tank company. As the US shifts away from its fighting insurgencies and the war on terror back to fighting near-peer adversaries, so too is its BCTs changing. The Waypoint 2028 program, later rebranded to Army 2030, is looking to fundamentally redesign how America deploys its battalion combat teams with a focus on armor to face near-peer threats. This redesign aims to move artillery from the BCT to the divisional level, much the same as Russia is attempting to do. 
so that it can be better employed across a wide engagement front while also improving survivability in a heavily contested electronic warfare environment where communications may not always be guaranteed between units. Engineering units are also being reorganized to a divisional level for much the same reason. As has famously been said, war doesn't tolerate BS, and the American battalion combat team has been put to the fire multiple times. Each time its superior mobility and coordination proved decisive, while Russia's smaller battalion tactical groups, ironically smaller and meant to be more maneuverable, have not been. This is largely due to training, leadership, and doctrine though. The biggest flaw with the Russian military is a lack of professional training and soldiers both. With a culture of abuse and corruption, the Russian armed forces have a difficult time retaining recruits and only an estimated 2% of conscripts chose to sign an enlistment contract at the end of their mandatory service. This extremely high turnover rate means that the Russian military lacks seasoned troops which form the backbone of any modern military and directly leads to a crippling lack of non-commissioned officers. Before the war in Ukraine, Russia attempted to fix this by creating new training programs for NCOs and offering incentives for soldiers to re-enlist. As the war has shown, this has not been enough. Regular Russian officers have been forced to pick up the duties an NCO would, and senior officers have even been spotted leading platoon-sized actions. Inevitably, these senior officers get killed or wounded, further eroding the discipline and capabilities of the Russian military. If all the managers at a restaurant disappeared because they'd been killed, It'd be very difficult for a bunch of cashiers, cooks, and waitstaff to do the specialized tasks senior management is responsible for, such as ordering, handling pay and benefits, scheduling, etc. In effect, this is what's happening with the Russian military today. Its brain drain slowly attrits the forces, and every day the Russian military is in effect getting dumber. And that's really saying something. The United States, like every other modern nation, is having difficulty reaching recruitment quotas and retaining those already in service. Ironically, the US believed it would have difficulty recruiting during the lengthy wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it wasn't until the withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan that a true recruitment crisis occurred. Today, the US Army is short 25% of its needed recruits, with estimates putting the US Army down 7% of its current force numbers in two years. Other services aren't suffering as badly, but still face their own challenges, with only the US Marines coming out relatively okay thanks to strong retention rates. The US military is struggling to remain competitive versus a strong economy, and the lack of conflict ironically means that potential recruits don't see service as a critical nation need, and nothing could be further from the truth given the potential threat of conflict with China. COVID, however, has had a significant effect on the recruitment crisis, with an explosion of mental and physical health issues amongst the younger Americans who would normally fill out the military's ranks. Also, adherence to physical and mental standards disqualifies a large group of individuals from even considering service in the first place. And while the US could do like China and lower recruitment standards over half a dozen times, doing so would only result in subpar troops. Recruitment crisis and its implications for an all-volunteer force aside, the US military is worlds away from the Russian military in professionalism and education. Hazing exists, as it does in any major organization. But in the Russian army, this is actively encouraged rather than punished. Likewise, US troopers aren't stripping the wiring out of their vehicles to sell at a local market. A strong NCO corps ensures discipline and training standards are met, as well as an institutional system of oversight and accountability. Whereas in the Russian military, training is typically done only long enough for someone to snap a picture of it and send it up the chain as proof. There are multiple levels of accountability for US personnel, and unlike a heavily conscripted force, American servicemen generally want to increase their training and education. Education is something the US military takes very seriously, heavily encouraging personnel at all levels to pursue higher education by making it free. For senior personnel, the US also operates five world-class war colleges, which instruct American officers alongside officers from nations all over the world. For America, war is both a science and an art form. But the real difference between the two militaries is their very fundamental nature. The US military encourages, even instills in its personnel a sense of initiative. The Russian army does not. Russia continues to fight like its Soviet predecessor, with a heavy top-down command structure that discourages personal initiative. The US military by comparison encourages leadership at every level, from an individual squad leader to a senior general, to act on their own initiative after exercising good judgment. This makes the US a military of many potential leaders, insulating it from the combat attrition of command personnel. Meanwhile, we have plenty of evidence from Ukraine 
of entire Russian units paralyzed because of severed links to command staff. This glaring vulnerability of the Russian military is what originally prompted the US to develop the most lethal war doctrine to date, air-land battle, now evolved to sea-air-land battle. This operational doctrine is the core philosophy of how the US fights wars, and it was revealed to the world for the first time in the early 1990s during Operation Desert Storm. It's so frighteningly effective that it took even US military planners completely by surprise, sweeping aside one of the world's largest armies with absolute ease. Sea Air Land Battle seeks to present an adversary with conundrums across the full warfighting spectrum to sow chaos and uncertainty amongst the enemy, opening up vulnerabilities and opportunities in one or more domains. To achieve this, the US has become a truly combined arms force, with ground, air, space, and naval assets tightly coordinated together via tactical data links, something Russia is still struggling with to this day. While Russia has coordinated its aerospace forces with ground-based air defenses, it struggled to loop in its ground combat units to achieve what the US had long ago mastered – common engagement capability. This is the ability for one spotter to observe an enemy and guide another shooter's weapons to the target, and it's the secret behind the US's lethality. Unlike Soviet forces which sought decisive battles with overwhelming force, the US specializes in launching deep strikes into enemy's rear areas specifically targeting logistics and command and control, or C2 nodes. This is why the US has placed a heavy emphasis on its air forces, stealth and standoff attack capability, as well as extreme precision rocket artillery, soon to be supplemented with ground-based ballistic missiles with extremely long ranges. While the air force is busy making a mess of the enemy's communications and supplies, ground forces strike at the enemy in smaller, more mobile formations that attack from a variety of different directions. This makes it difficult for the enemy to coordinate a defense, especially when their command and control has been disrupted or destroyed. A focus on rapid mobility and communications allows the US to quickly identify breaches in enemy formations and rapidly exploit them with overwhelming force. The US has basically adopted Muhammad Ali's famous adage of floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee, and it's proven its mettle against numerically superior forces time and again. Now let's look at the specifics of what actually makes the US a superior force over the Russian military. Let's start with the basics. Communications Communications is key to battlefield success. Without it, you can't tell your troops what to do and when to do it. Of all the investments and in technology that the US has made, few surpass the untold billions that went into building the most robust, secure battlefield networks in the world, and they are the key to the US's success. Thanks to tactical data links, the Link 16 and future replacement Link 22, American units can freely swap information between each other. Even weapons en route to their target can speak to another, such as the new long-range anti-ship missile, which can deconflict when launched in volleys to ensure all missiles don't hit the same target, and can update target priorities as missiles in a volley are knocked out by enemy air defenses. But at the very basic level, secure communications allows the US to move units around and coordinate without letting the enemy be privy to this information. Russia does not have this capability. Immediately after the invasion began, frontline reports from Ukrainian troops revealed that communications amongst Russian military was very poor, with units often relying on unencrypted civilian radios or even cell phones. Russian strategic bombers, the very same craft responsible for delivering a retaliatory nuclear strike, were also recorded using unsecured communications. On paper, Russia is supposed to have secure, encrypted communications for all or at least most of its units. Russian soldiers have been observed using advanced radios such as the R-187P1 Azart and the R-162 5UN2, both of which were discovered on a captured Russian paratrooper after the failed Antonov airport attack. However, the fighting in Ukraine has shown that this is simply not the case, and one need only look at Russia's history of corruption to understand why. In 2021, senior military figures and the manufacturer of the Azart radio came under investigation for embezzlement, with millions of rubles meant to purchase encrypted radios for the military vanishing into the pockets of various officials instead. To make matters worse, as Ukraine gets better at pinpointing Russian communication, officers are moving further and further away from the front, to the point that Russian units have reported having to resort to cell phones to reach them and ask for orders. The general failure of the Russian officer corps aside, which cowardly moves to the rear as they send their own men to their death, going up against a technologically advanced foe such as the United States with unsecure communications, is its own death sentence. The US has made communications a top priority, 
issuing the ANPRC-148 to its combat units. In fact, communications are so important that units in the field will typically deploy with multiple backups, including radios for local traffic and long-range radios and satellite radios for emergencies. Embedded personnel such as Air Force combat controllers will have their own radios to communicate with overhead aircraft waiting to bring the boom when asked, and they can even stream video directly from overhead assets to get a bird's eye view of the battlefield, taking advantage of superior sensors on US aircraft. If there is one flaw with US communications, it's that there are too many different radios, and efforts to consolidate them into a single system have so far failed. That hasn't stopped the US from throwing millions at the problem until eventually, hopefully, it goes away, something that it's exceptionally good at to a fault. The next significant difference between the two militaries' infantry is their equipment. Take a look at these two photos and see if you can spot the differences. Anyone who served in the ground combat role can probably spot them immediately, but don't feel bad if you can't. The differences are subtle, but make all the difference in the world, and makes US soldiers far superior to their Russian counterparts. Need a clue? Look at the helmets, specifically the front of the helmets. You might notice that Russian helmets have no mounts for night vision. Now look at the rifles and compare the rifles of the American soldiers with those of the Russian soldiers. Spot a difference? Most Russian rifles come with no optics whatsoever, while American combat rifles already have optics when given to the troops. Even more importantly, American rifles carry the PAK family of laser systems, which are critical for aiming with night vision. Russian rifles do not carry these. So even on the rare occasion that a Russian soldier might have night vision, which is estimated at 1 in 10 soldiers, they're unable to use their rifles while also using their night vision. By comparison, every single US soldier is issued night vision and the required laser targeting system with which to use it properly. Other key differences include the mass adoption of armored vests by the US military, while most troops who are lucky enough to be issued body armor in the Russian military are typically issued what are colloquially known as second chance vests, poorly suited for stopping high-powered rifle rounds. US soldiers also carry supplemental equipment such as radios, gloves, knee pads, and eye protection. Russian soldiers largely lack these small bits of kit that can end up giving an edge to a warfighter. And we're not cherry-picking here, you're welcome to look up photos of US soldiers in action versus their Russian counterparts. While there are elite Russian units who have access to what is standard US infantry, the entire point is that this is standard for all US infantry. The US owns the night and prefers to run night combat operations to exercise its vast advantage in imaging over any potential adversary. But more importantly, the US invests heavily in making sure its troops have the right equipment for the job and this extends to its combat vehicles. American optics are on the whole superior to their Russian counterparts, especially as sanctions kick in and Russia's denied Western optics or the components to build its own. New Russian tanks are being sent to the front with nothing more than gunner sights, significantly lessening their effectiveness against Western tanks being donated to Ukraine. By the way, Russia had invested heavily into developing a native capability to build advanced night vision devices. However, the entire affair collapsed in on itself when corruption inevitably took a massive bite out of the budget, and the officials overseeing the company set up to produce domestic night vision kit were discovered to be siphoning off funds for themselves instead. Now when Russia needs it the most, it's unable to produce the specialized components required for night vision optics. The entire Russian military suffers from a lack of kit that would be considered standard in the US military. Russian aviation, for example, has only a few aircraft capable of providing accurate air support for ground units, as the bulk of its air fleet lacks the targeting pods necessary for the task. The US, by comparison, has hundreds of these aircraft and can basically bolt on a targeting pod to just about anything that you can think of hurling into the sky. An Abrams tank might not be very aerodynamic, but if it wanted to, the US could strap a targeting pod and a rocket onto it and for its brief flight through the sky be capable of delivering accurate ground fire for friendly forces. Russia's inability to do the same was on full display during the famed Belgorod incursion by the Free Russia Legion and Russian Volunteer Corps, when a Russian Su-34 dropped dumb gravity bombs that missed their target by a generous few hundred meters or so. The differences between the Russian and American military are so significant that we could probably do an entire 60-minute episode on the topic. Matter of fact, if this video gets enough views, we'll do a part two and present even more evidence from Ukraine on how the United States would absolutely decimate the Russian military. And for anyone who still doubts this or thinks we're just shilling for the US, remember that in June of 2022, the US sent a dozen HIMARS batteries to Ukraine 
and it absolutely wrecked Russia's day. If Russia has yet to eliminate a single of the now 30 or so estimated HIMARS in Ukraine, how exactly does it expect to cope with the 400 still in the US inventory? Russia and NATO seem just one accident away from full-blown war, but if it went down, what would it look like and who would come out on top? Day 1 In the opening day of hostilities, NATO warplanes are immediately put into effect. Planning for every contingency, including an outbreak of hostilities over the Ukraine war, has been accomplished ahead of time, and the response is as automatic as a reflex. Nations all over Europe immediately mobilize their militaries and call up their reserves, while the United States calls up its own reserves and National Guards. A naval task force consisting of US and European vessels immediately heads for the Baltic Sea. Attack submarines and ASW vessels head for picket positions across the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap. Their job will be to stop any attempts by the Russian Navy to break out into the Atlantic, where it could potentially threaten US transports, bringing over the bulk of America's firepower to Europe. Of special concern are Russia's submarines, which must not be allowed to break out into the Atlantic at any cost. A furious hunt for any Russian subs unaccounted for begins across the Atlantic and North Pacific. In Kaliningrad, both Russia and NATO exchange a furious flurry of ground-launched cruise and ballistic missiles at each other. NATO has the firepower advantage. Russian stocks have been severely depleted due to the war in Ukraine and the need to pull from special reserves held in case of exactly this scenario. Russia has robbed Peter to pay Paul, and now it's coming up short in long-range attack missiles meant to slow down NATO air operations by destroying runways and other critical infrastructure across Poland, eastern Germany, and the Czech Republic. These sites are well defended by modern air defense systems, though, and lacking the ability to saturate NATO defenses, Russia's strikes inflict only moderate damage, slowing but not stopping air operations. Of greater effectiveness is attacks into the Baltic NATO members, destroying ports and other coastal infrastructure. Russia is attempting to prevent NATO forces from landing in the Baltics and threatening it directly. A massive air attack escorted by MiGs devastates multiple security fortifications across Russia's land border with the Baltic states. Follow-on strikes hit at each country's military command and control networks. NATO was always hard-pressed to defend the Baltics in case of a war with Russia, and because the surprise attack left little time to deploy aircraft to defend the skies of the Baltic states, the Russian attack is largely successful. Russian troops stationed along the border immediately roll into Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia in three separate thrusts toward each nation's capital. They only have a few days to secure the Baltics before NATO firepower beats it back. There's a quiet but tense peace in the north, as NATO's newest member is poised to join the fighting. Not wanting to open up an even bigger front for the already overextended Russian army, Putin tells his troops to dig in near the Finnish border. He knows it would be impossible to win a war against NATO if he opened up another front line. Leaving a token defense force while focusing the rest of the army's efforts in the south is the best option for the crazy dictator. For now, neither side dares to cross the border, so a sort of truce remains in effect. Sweden, however, has the luxury of time and distance. A NATO aspirant, Sweden knows exactly which way the wind is blowing in this war and throws its support behind NATO. Its navy begins a hunt for Russian subs, knowing that Russian air power is tied up in the assault on the Baltic states and largely unable to threaten it. Week 2 NATO has every advantage against Russia, but many of its European members experience readiness issues. An air campaign against Russian air defense networks, radar installations, command and control nodes, and other vital security infrastructure has been slow to manifest. But once it does, Russia is immediately put into the defensive. Wild weasel combat aircraft fly into the teeth of Russian air defenses. Specially modified and equipped with special purpose weapons, these daring pilots are trained to destroy enemy radars and air defense batteries. These must be suppressed before the bulk of NATO air power can do its job. Russia, though, has an extremely dense air defense network, and the job will take time. This means that in the Baltics, Russia currently has the advantage as its troops push ever closer toward the Baltic capitals. However, daring raids from multiple NATO carriers in the Baltics and the activation of NATO's Rapid Response Force have slowed the Russian assault to a crawl. NATO forces only number the thousands versus Russia's tens of thousands, but many of these Russian troops are either conscripts or on rotation out of Ukraine. Though combat veterans, they still suffer from war weariness, poor training, and bad doctrine. This is a force multiplier for NATO defenders, who are better trained and equipped and are supported by combat vehicles more capable than their Russian counterparts. But the Russian Baltic thrust has been slowed, not stopped, and realistically no NATO member has any great hope that the Baltics can truly be defended. It'll take weeks to assemble and transport large amounts of firepower into ports still under Russian attack. Week 3 
Deep penetration strikes by the American B-2 bombers flying over the North Pole inflict catastrophic damage to Russian oil infrastructure in the Far East and the Urals. Submarine-launched cruise missiles add to the destruction of all important oil refineries, processing centers, and distribution networks. This sends a cold chill down the backs of Russian leadership, as these could just have easily been nuclear attacks. Despite dense air defense networks, only a single B-2 bomber is destroyed so far in the ongoing campaign. In the Pacific, the Russian fleet is bottled up in the Kamchatka Peninsula, under threat of destruction thanks to an American carrier strike group. With shore-based Granite anti-ship missile batteries, the fleet is kept safely out of range of American vessels. The Granite missile features a one-ton warhead, and though it might be old, it's still a capable and deadly threat to even America's big capital ships, the supercarriers. But Russia is unprepared for an air attack featuring America's newest anti-ship missile. The LRASM features a 1,000-pound warhead in a sleek body made of stealthy material. The missiles are launched from B-52s taking off from Japanese airfields at a range of over 230 miles and uses GPS and data links to guide themselves to their targets. However, on approach, the missiles go quiet and rely on their onboard artificial intelligence to plot an attack route, diving to just a few feet over the wave tops. Russian air defense radar detects them at a few dozen miles out, but they have less than 40 seconds to respond. Russian ships fire off volleys of interceptors as the LRASM's electronic brain scan the Russian ships and use image recognition software to identify each individual warship. Speaking to each other, the missiles assign their own targets as they scream in at 600 miles an hour. The volley of air defense missiles intercept multiple LRASMs, but many more punch through to hit their targets. The 1,000-pound warhead is on a delayed fuse, allowing it to penetrate into the hull of its target vessel before detonating to cause massive internal damage. Hundreds of sailors die. Six of the 11 major surface vessels of the Pacific Fleet are destroyed. Two more are seriously damaged. The Slava-class cruiser Vyag, flagship of the Pacific Fleet, has been targeted with great prejudice. In Europe, NATO forces are forced to pull out of the Baltics. With the Finnish front at a standstill, the Baltics were always undefendable. Kaliningrad stands in the way of NATO reinforcement, and the enclave is heavily militarized. NATO has long ago established air supremacy over Kaliningrad, but it was a difficult fight that cost the Alliance dozens of attack aircraft. A ground offensive will finally begin soon, though, as NATO European firepower is massing in eastern Germany and Poland. Forces from Britain, Spain, France, Germany, and Poland will be the vanguard of this attack. Turkey leads an air and naval effort to destroy the Russian Black Sea Fleet and attack Russian positions in Crimea. NATO's other members prepare themselves for a reinforcing push into Ukraine, where they'll link up with Ukraine's defenders and push east and south into Crimea itself. Despite Russia invading NATO territory directly, most of NATO's leadership agrees that a push into Russia itself is unacceptable and it could be a provocation to use nuclear weapons. Week 4 NATO special forces unleash a campaign of sabotage inside Russia, bringing down railway bridges, destroying tracks, and setting ablaze important industrial and commercial targets. Taking a cue from Ukraine, NATO SOF wages a guerrilla campaign inside Russia itself, striking hard and fast, then melting back into the population. For its part, Russia has unleashed its own campaign of sabotage, but because of efforts in Ukraine, it's severely limited in scope. A plan to disrupt NATO operations with huge numbers of Spetsnaz agents all across Europe only results in small numbers of successful operations with minimal impact on NATO's ability to coordinate or move forces. Russian air defenses have been attrited considerably all across its western flank. With unchallenged air supremacy, Russian forces in Kaliningrad are routed and destroyed as the German-led offensive smashes Russian defenses. Using weapons such as smart cluster munitions, able to select their own targets and attack them from above, NATO aircraft bring a level of destruction to Russian forces not seen since Desert Storm. NATO air losses are significant, but blunted considerably by the widespread use of stealth aircraft such as the F-35, which lead the air campaign. With their ability to network with other friendly planes, F-35s are able to get deeper into Russian air defense networks and then direct weapons launched by non-stealthy planes to their targets. Russia's air force is swept out of the sky. The only real challenge to NATO is Russia's ground-based air defenses, which must be hunted down and eliminated one by one. With the sheer numbers of them, though, the task is a slow one, in turn slowing down the ground campaign. In both arenas, though, NATO looks to be superior in terms of doctrine, tactics, and equipment. Russia's only hope is to hold NATO in Belarus and the southern Baltics. Week 6 Russian forces are increasingly spread thin across Ukraine and the Baltics. Losses in combat against NATO forces are significantly higher than against Ukrainian forces. 
Russia rushes masses of conscripts to man large defensive works supported by hordes of artillery, exactly the tactic used so successfully in Ukraine. But unlike in Ukraine, Russia now faces the most technologically capable air forces in the world. American Wild Weasel aircraft systematically hunt down and eliminate enemy air defenses, allowing for aligned ground attack aircraft to swoop down on Russian artillery positions while F-15s and Typhoons provide air cover. Russian troops meanwhile are being pummeled by precision artillery and special munitions launched from NATO bombers designed to destroy infantry in trenches. Every single attack is precise to within a few meters. Even in their trenches, Russian troops are not safe. Just minutes after each bombardment finishes, the rumbling of British challengers and European leopards is heard, descending on the defenders like an armored fist. Any Russian tanks stupid enough to try to challenge NATO armor are instead met by attack helicopters or strafed by ground attack aircraft like the vaunted A-10. Any that survive are easily destroyed by European tanks with far greater range, precision, and sensors. This is the combined arms warfare that Russia attempted and failed at in Ukraine. Week 8 NATO's biggest limitation is manpower. Despite being roundly defeated militarily when its forces meet NATO forces, Russia has been better prepared for war than NATO and with more combat-ready ground forces. NATO has needed time to mobilize. Some nations like Germany needed time to sort out bad logistics, and the US has had to transport its firepower over to Europe. By the end of the second month of fighting, though, Russia faces the growing might of the US Army and Marines, which relieve weary European forces across much of the front. Unlike NATO, Russia can't rotate its troops out of combat, and every two weeks they're forced into combat with NATO troops that have had time to rest and recuperate. Under the intense pressure of Western combined arms warfare, Russian morale is quickly breaking. Much like in Desert Storm, Russian troops find themselves under attack from all domains simultaneously. NATO electronic warfare operations disrupt their ability to communicate, as deep strikes into their rear eliminate command bunkers and vehicles foolish enough to transmit orders to the troops at the front. Meanwhile, precision air and artillery attacks make it impossible for armored vehicles to operate on the front, and infantry working in conjunction with armor and attack helicopters continuously probe at defenses and immediately exploit any weaknesses. By comparison with command networks disrupted or destroyed, Russian forces lack the personal initiative to make decisions on their own. Not that it would do much good if they did, as NATO's increasing air supremacy makes it perilous to mass forces for an attempt at an attack. Russia's only hope is to fight a continuous sequence of defensive battles, hoping to bleed NATO forces to the point that the squeamish Western public has had enough and gives up on the war. This is the one advantage Russia has over the West. Vladimir Putin has spent two decades preparing his people for an ideological war with the West. More to the point, though, the Russian people seem to be at their core extremely self-sacrificial and much better suited to bearing the incredible cost of this war's casualties than their Western counterparts. Russia will lose this war. It would have lost even if it had never invaded Ukraine. But after the failed invasion and decimation of its best forces in Ukraine, it has no chance of winning against NATO's might now. But if Western populations pull their support and grow squeamish about the mounting casualties, Russia has a chance to negotiate a favorable peace deal. NATO's forces are the finest in the world, but their populations might be unprepared for the costs of a real war. Throughout history, Russia has enjoyed a leadership of generals who graduated from some of the world's top military academies. Fortunately for Ukraine, the only school Russia's current military leaders graduated from was Clown College. This is the dumbest reason why Russia is slowly losing the war for Ukraine. Russia is by far the superior military power to Ukraine. In terms of numbers of troops and equipment, it's amongst the top three, if not necessarily quality. Even with poorly maintained equipment, bad doctrine, and poorly motivated troops, though, it takes an extraordinarily dumb reason for Russia to be losing this war. OPSEC is a term anyone who has served in the US or a closely aligned military has had drilled into their heads for the entire term of their enlistment. Operational security is the concept of maintaining security of ongoing operations so as to deny the enemy information which could be exploited for military or political use. Back when war was a relatively crude affair, it was easy to maintain good OPSEC. As technology has evolved, though, so too have militaries had to evolve to keep the prying eyes of their enemy away. Modern OPSEC is a complicated affair which troops at every level are responsible for, and Russia has failed completely in this regard, possibly to the point of costing them the war. Before the war started, the entire world was drinking the Russian Kool-Aid, believing it to be a modern and very capable power. While this was a critical intelligence failure, it was due in large part because of a wonderful bit of maskirova by the Russian government. 
who conducted regular highly choreographed exercises with hand-picked troops to prove it was capable of modern combined arms operations. Contrary to what we were previously led to believe, Russia is not capable of any of the things it used to display. Strategic bombers are some of the most important assets in any military's arsenal, which is why you want to make sure that your communications with these expensive and often nuclear-capable tools are well encrypted. So imagine the West's surprise when Russian strategic bombers crossed into Ukrainian airspace and started broadcasting communications via unsecured frequencies, giving Ukraine great insight into their targets and procedures. But it wasn't just Russia's most important air assets who were clear-casting their full intentions. Russia's ground units got in on the fun, too. U.S. intelligence-gathering platforms, such as its fleet of rivet joint aircraft, were fully prepared for the task of breaking Russian encryption. So imagine their surprise when Russian units started broadcasting status reports, attack plans, and troop movements via the equivalent of civilian walkie-talkies. Ukrainian civilians immediately took to the airwaves and started trolling Russian units in real time broadcasting confusing reports, engaging in radio flame wars, or just filling the airwaves with the Ukrainian national anthem or even the theme song for Barney the Dinosaur, so that Russian units couldn't understand anything broadcasted on them. Russian generals and senior officers were also frequently using unsecured communications early in the war. The United States, which spent 20 years sniffing out the electronic emissions of high-value insurgent and terrorist VIPs, was quick to locate these unsecured calls and pass along targeting data to Ukrainian forces. One Excalibur-guided artillery shell later, and Russia had one less senior officer, a trend that only increased with the introduction of HIMARS with its longer reach. At least this gross violation of OPSEC wasn't entirely the fault of poor Russian military doctrine. Rather, the problem that Russia quickly ran into was that during peacetime, Comrade Colonel Koruptovich had sold all the unit's fancy radio equipment for a tidy profit. That left Private Konskriptovich scouring occupied Ukrainian towns and cities for any piece of radio equipment they could find, which was naturally not encrypted to military standards or at all. As a closely related side note, Russia also immediately ran into a problem coordinating its forces due to a lack of communication. This time, though, it wasn't a lack of equipment. In fact, Russia's FSB agents sent to coordinate military action directly with the highest levels of government were carrying some of the most advanced encrypted pieces of comm gear on the planet. Years earlier, when the Russians realized that the US had cracked their encryption, they spent millions of dollars building a new, highly secured system that could ensure communication with the Kremlin from anywhere on the planet. Well, anywhere on the planet that had cell reception because Russia's fancy gear immediately failed when entering Ukraine, because Comrade General Clown Shoes had ordered airstrikes against Ukraine's cellular communication towers. This was meant to make it impossible for Ukrainian partisan forces to coordinate, and it probably worked. Unfortunately, the FSB was then forced to use regular phones to send reports back to the Kremlin, which the US greedily scooped up with its vast intelligence apparatus. These reports helped Ukraine's defenders be exactly where they were needed the most, or could do the most damage. Russia's biggest problem is that it's one of the world's best militaries for killing civilians or attacking lightly armed rebel forces in Syria. When Russian Federation troops entered Ukraine, their leadership was completely unprepared to fight a modern electronic war, which is ironic given the emphasis put by Russia on electronic warfare as a way to counter NATO capabilities. In fact, Russian EW capabilities are formidable, and in recent years they fielded some very powerful battlefield EW platforms, which would make NATO coordination difficult. That's why it was really nice of their troops to retreat and leave one of those vehicles completely intact for Ukrainian forces to capture and immediately send to the US for analysis. On the offense, though, Russia honestly has some significant capabilities to operate in the electromagnetic spectrum. But on the defense, well, Russia has had to learn extremely painful lessons. It's bad enough when your forces are broadcasting their plans via civilian radios, but Russian troops were apparently completely unprepared for the speed at which Western nations could sniff out electronic emissions, pass word along to Ukraine, and then put steel on target. When Chechnya sent troops to Ukraine, they came with a fearsome reputation. And to their credit, there truly are no more fearsome TikTok warriors than the Chechens. These guys used to upload a dozen videos a day showing off their equipment, boasting of their battlefield prowess, and commenting on the cowardice of Ukrainian defenders. They upload much fewer videos now, mostly because a lot of them are dead. However, one Chechen commander just couldn't wait to get back to the rear area before uploading his latest TikTok, and after completing a military operation, whipped out his phone to brag about the great defeat his forces had just delivered to the Ukrainians. Apparently, nobody told the Ukrainians they had been defeated, because halfway through his live stream, 
They raised a polite objection to his comments in the form of a 105mm precision guided artillery shell. By live streaming, this soldier was effectively giving precise targeting coordinates to within a meter or two to the Ukrainian artillery, and they were more than happy to respond. The incident was captured on live stream to the shock of his audience. The Chechens aren't the only invading forces who are finding their love of social media is getting them killed, though. Early in the war, as the Russians advanced on Kyiv, many Russian soldiers began making cell phone calls or uploading social media posts while on the move. This not only allowed Ukraine to track Russian forces in real time, but in more than one instance it helped home in missile and precision artillery fire on Russian positions. According to Ukraine's intelligence chief, these cell calls and social media posts helped a lot when they were targeting Russian forces. It's not just Russian forces shooting themselves in the foot, though. Russian journalists have been happy to do their part to help Ukraine win as well. Famously, Russian reporter Alexander Kotz did a live piece on a brand new mortar carrier being fielded by the Russian military. This allowed Ukrainian forces to discern its exact location and then later lure it out of hiding only to destroy it with a precision attack. Kotz would go on to deny that his report was to blame, but it seems a strange coincidence how immediately after his reporting, the Ukrainians were able to locate this fancy new piece of gear and give it a very early retirement. Russian war reporter Sergei Sreda, though, saw what Kotz had done and said, hold my beer. On tour of the occupied areas of Ukraine, Sreda was invited to the local headquarters of the infamous Wagner private military company in Popasna. Better suited to killing civilians in Syria than fighting a real war, Wagner was a good host for the Kremlin propagandists, though, who eagerly snapped a photo of himself shaking hands with one of their leaders. While he was at it, he made sure to get a cool new pic for his Tinder profile alongside of some of Wagner's best and brightest. Unfortunately, nobody involved bothered to think about the fact that the photo included the exact address of the building housing Wagner's HQ. Perhaps unsurprisingly, immediately upon uploading, Wagner received a new visitor. This time, though, it was Uncle Heimarsk. The building was completely destroyed along with an undetermined number of Wagner mercenaries who honestly probably saved themselves a lot of effort dying behind the front lines rather than directly upon arriving at the front lines as is historically the case. Russian tourists have gotten in on the effort to help Russia defeat itself, and back in August, one Russian tourist was of great service to Ukraine's defenders. On holiday in the occupied Crimean Peninsula, this unnamed tourist snapped a cool photo of himself near some military vehicles. Thoughtlessly uploading the photo online, Ukraine was able to identify the vehicle in the background as an S-400 launcher and using the photo's metadata, get an exact location on the air defense unit's location. While not immediately destroyed, being able to map out Russian air defenses would later give it the ability to target them thanks to American high-speed anti-radiation missiles. Russia has proven it is stubbornly resistant to learning from its mistakes, much to Ukraine's gratitude. Of all the operational security failures, likely none takes the cake quite like the now infamous New Year's Eve strike, which might have killed as many as hundreds of brand new Russian conscripts. At a minute after midnight on New Year's Eve, Ukraine delivered a terrifying strike on Russian troops. Utilizing several HIMARS rockets, Ukraine leveled the Professional Technical School No. 19 in Makivka inside of the separatist enclave of Donetsk. The attack was carried out thanks to the use of cell phones by the Russian troops, who were calling loved ones or exchanging text messages. Rather than heart or grinning emojis, Ukraine responded with HIMARS rockets to the face. The strike was deadly. With Ukraine claiming hundreds had died, Russian officials reported only around 60 had been killed, later revising that figure to just over 80. However, a significant number of pro-Russian bloggers with sources amongst the Russian military all gave figures closer to Ukraine's claim than the official Russian one. The strike was devastating, but it was helped along by the fact that Russia's military leaders are a bunch of doorstops. Some genius comrade colonel had decided the best place to store ammunition, including artillery shells, was in the same place housing a large concentration of troops. The initial strike would have caused large damage to the building, but the resulting secondary explosion sealed the fate of what's likely hundreds of Russians who got to live for exactly one minute into 2023, all freshly arrived to Ukraine. Adding to the tragedy is the fact that such a large concentration of troops and range of precision artillery should never have happened, especially not on top of an ammo dump. But then again, this hasn't been a video about why Russia's military leaders are the brightest on Earth. What was once a running joke has turned into terrifying reality for Russian soldiers. Russia has officially sent 75-year-old T-54s and T-55s to Ukraine. What in the world is going on with the Russian military? Where did all of its modern tanks go? And why can't one of the largest countries in the world simply build new ones? 
the T-55 was a monster of a tank when it made its debut three quarters of a century ago. Entering service immediately after the end of the Second World War, the T-55 would go on to become one of the most produced tanks in history, with an estimated 100,000 built. The tank has played a role in every major and most minor conflicts of the Cold War, and its introduction scared the NATO allies so bad that Britain hurried to develop a brand new tank gun and the US rushed the M60 tank into production. In its day, the T-54, T-55 was a formidable monster, with 205mm of frontal turret armor and 120mm slanted hull armor. The tank was so tough that in trials it proved it could survive a nuclear explosion up to 15 kilotons in yield at a range of just over 300 meters though its crew needed a range of about 700 meters to be protected from the pressure wave. Its 100 millimeter gun could penetrate about 300 millimeters of rolled steel armor, making it a significant threat to anything in NATO inventories. Its crew enjoyed the benefit of some of the finest thermal sights, giving the tank the ability to operate at night. But that was in the 1950s. Today, the T-55 is a sign of desperation for an embattled Russia. So what in the world happened to its tanks? Russia's initial offensive into Ukraine was a compendium of tactical blunders and poor doctrine. Tanks are the fiercest weapon on any battlefield. Jets and bombers can deliver more destruction, but they can't take and hold ground like a tank can. Their main cannons can level most small buildings. In fact, some tanks have specialized rounds to do just that. Their modern advanced composite armor utilizes a variety of materials working together to defeat even the most powerful projectiles. And anything a tank can't blast apart, it can simply run over and crush under its massive treads, with most modern main battle tanks weighing in at around 60 tons. But all of that means very little if tanks aren't properly supported, as Russia has failed to learn in three major conflicts now. Because as impressive as tanks are, they have some glaring vulnerabilities which Russia's enemies have exploited to astonishing effect. During the First Chechen War, Russia mobilized its massive arsenal of tanks and armored vehicles with a plan to literally crush the Chechen resistance underfoot. Up against a force a fraction of their size, with no tanks of their own, the war was a foregone conclusion until suddenly it wasn't. Because while the Chechen rebels didn't have tanks, they did have RPGs, anti-tank missiles, and even IEDs and tank mines, as well as an incredibly good doctrine that exploited Russia's biggest vulnerability. Russian warfighting doctrine states that tanks lead the way with infantry fighting vehicles providing close support. However, the infantry inside the infantry fighting vehicles can't do their job if they're not dismounted, and it's awfully hard to provide much support when you're looking at the world and scanning for threats through a very narrow armored slit. During the invasion of Chechnya, the Russians had a problem, mainly that the Chechen rebels refused to play ball and come out of their cities for a nice clean fight that Russia would absolutely dominate. Instead, the rebels hid inside the cities and put up a stiff urban resistance, utilizing dense urban terrain and verticality to their greatest advantage. Assaulting into the city meant a rebel could be in any window, ready to fire down at a moment's notice. The Russians thus decided the best way to protect their infantry was to keep it inside their armored vehicles. The Chechens were counting on this. Rebel forces used the verticality of the urban terrain to get up above the tanks, providing them with two distinct advantages. The first was that from above the tank they could use weapons that would normally have little to no effect against the thick front armor, or even the slightly less thick side and rear armor of the tanks. Because tanks can't be well protected from every angle, or else no engine on earth could move them, they have to make some sacrifices. This is why the front armor is the strongest. In most fights, this is where the fire is going to be coming from. Side and rear armor is robust but thinner to save weight. But the roof of the tank has very thin armor, often just a dozen or two dozen millimeters thick. The Abrams, for instance, has about an inch of roof armor, mainly to protect the crew from artillery shell fragments. This thin roof armor was especially vulnerable to regular rocket-propelled grenades, which the Chechens had in abundance. Ironically, a lot of their RPGs came from Russian soldiers who sold equipment to villagers in exchange for food, alcohol, or cigarettes. Those same villagers sold the RPGs right back to the rebels, or sometimes were outright working with them. With so many of these simple and cheap weapons lying around, the Chechens used the verticality of urban terrain to get above the tanks, and Russian armor soon became a critically endangered species. But it wasn't just the thin roof armor. The second weakness exploited by the Chechens was the lack of elevation on Russian tanks' main guns. An M1 Abrams has an elevation of plus 20 to negative 10 degrees on its gun, allowing it significant vertical reach. 
A T-72, meanwhile, has an elevation of only plus 14 to negative 6 degrees. A T-80 is slightly better, with a range of plus 18 to negative 4 degrees. Such a poor range on Russian tanks meant they were physically unable to respond to enemy action in the windows and roofs above their head, frustrating Russian tankers as they watched their friends get destroyed from above. BMPs with supporting infantry would fare much better with a gun elevation of 74 degrees for the BMP-2. This vehicle was designed to take out or at least scare off enemy attack helicopters with its main gun, giving it a much greater vertical reach. The problem, though, was that a gunner would have to try to identify threats and neutralize them by peering through a small armored slit, an incredibly difficult task while fighting in a close quarters, chaotic urban environment. The Chechens also exploited the tank's thin floor armor by utilizing IEDs and anti-tank mines. Often, they'd hide in holes in the ground or in sewers that the tanks would roll over, only to pop up and attach mines that resembled limpet anti-ship mines, or simply toss out an IED and duck for cover. The thin floor armor would provide little if any protection to the crew, so not only would those IEDs knock the vehicle out of commission, but it would also likely kill the crew. To counter all of these threats, most modern militaries utilize infantry. In a modern combined arms military, the infantry is often playing the role of babysitter for friendly armor but Western powers dismount their infantry to do so. While this makes them more vulnerable, it also allows them to better use their senses to detect and neutralize threats, while the Russians force them to remain inside their protected armored vehicles looking out a thin slit. When it came time to invade Ukraine, the world assumed that Russia had paid attention to its two humiliating lessons from both Chechen wars. The world would be wrong. As Russian armor poured into Ukraine, a peculiar sight began to appear across the country. Groups of Russian tanks all operating on their own, with no other armored vehicles or dismounted infantry to be seen anywhere. The Ukrainians saw much the same thing and immediately leapt to exploit their enemy's grave mistake. Mighty Russian armor was being absolutely decimated in a series of ambushes utilizing soldiers armed with Stugna and Western anti-tank weapons. In many cases, Russian armor famously panicked, prompting even more losses. The entire time, Russian infantry was nowhere to be seen. Russian doctrine hadn't changed since Chechnya, and its troops were equally poorly trained. In multiple instances where infantry was present, it failed to do its job of screening the flanks for armor forces. And instead, chaos caused by ambushes led to a visible breakdown of command and discipline. Every vehicle was out for itself, and infantry being ambushed by machine gun teams rushed to find cover next to or behind armored vehicles. More than a few grisly instances of Russians being crushed to death by their own vehicles have come to light since then. Russian troops were obviously not trained to properly screen the flanks, but they also lacked training to respond to ambushes. Responding to an ambush is one of the most basic lessons taught by any Western infantry school. With soldiers rallied in order to push through the ambush and get out of the kill zone ASAP, this throws the enemy's plans into confusion and denies them the advantage of carefully planned overlapping fields of fire as well as other nasty surprises that might be waiting to unleash on the forces stuck inside the kill zone. One year after its invasion of Ukraine, Russia has lost an estimated 1,600 of the 2,500 tanks it had rolled into Ukraine with. It's recovered and repaired or built brand new an estimated 850 of those lost tanks, but that was back in February. And by May, Russia had lost the biggest tank battle of the war, with 120 armored vehicle losses, which compounded with the rest of the casualties all along the Eastern Front. Only Russia knows how many tanks it's truly lost of the estimated 2,500 it began with, but its losses are bad enough to prompt it to move literal antiques out of storage and even museums and send them to the front lines. Every month, Russia fields increasingly less capable tanks, a problem for Ukraine as well, but one offset by the growing movement to send ever larger numbers of Western tanks to Ukraine. Russia's real problem, though, is that it can't hope to replenish its losses, while Ukraine can count on its Western allies for support. No one, except maybe a few individuals in the Russian government, truly knows how many Russian tanks it can produce each year. According to Russian sources, one of the largest armor plants can produce 20 tanks a month, but other sources say that it also refurbishes 8 tanks a month. This makes it unclear if the plant produces 20 total tanks, or 12 new tanks and 8 refurbished ones from its deep storage. Similar reports from other plants place their total at around 17 tanks a month. With two new tank plants being hurried through construction, an estimated 90 tanks could be hitting the battlefield a month, but nobody knows how many of those will be new T-80s or T-90s or simply refurbished T-62s and the like. Even at the most optimistic figure of 90 tanks hitting the battlefield, this simply doesn't compare with the 150 tanks Russia loses a month. What we do know is that the tanks coming off the assembly line are in no way modern. Both refurbished and new tanks are lacking modern electronics and specialized kit like thermal visions. 
With all these supplies coming from overseas, now cut off by sanctions, modern tanks like the T-90 are even harder to build, with Russia lacking specialized parts and tools needed for complex engineering. Less advanced T-72s are more achievable for Russia, though the country faces a similar problem as it did during World War II when tanks rolled right off the production line and straight into combat with no sights and no radios. Especially damaging to Russia's industry is sanctions targeting optical systems, ball bearings, and machine tools. Without Western supplies of thermal and night vision, Russia is being forced to either produce tanks without these vital components or push old tanks into a modern battlefield without them. Instead, Russia is putting basic gunner sights on its tanks, reducing the range of their cannons by an estimated 2 kilometers, and that matters a great deal as German Leopards begin to show up on Ukrainian battlefields, joined at the end of the summer by the American Abrams. Even against modern Russian tanks, Western armor had a decided range and precision advantage, but now Russia's only real hope is to use its armor in close quarters combat, where its tanks can be more accurate. The embargo on advanced semiconductors to Russia has also impeded its ability to develop new modern fire control computers, forcing it to cobble together what it can from civilian appliances or smuggle low quantities at great expense through China and other friendly nations. You probably don't think so much about ball bearings. We really didn't before we wrote the script, but ball bearings are critical for the production of modern vehicles. These shockingly simple devices are ingenious and function off the basic premise that things roll better than they slide. Yet it's no easy feat creating high-quality ball bearings which often have to endure high levels of heat and stress. The production of modern ball bearings is such a technological feat that nations are ranked by their capacity to create them, and unfortunately for Russia, it does not rank high on the list, with 55% of its ball bearings before the war all coming from Europe, Canada, and the United States. Now the nation is forced to rely on small domestic production and cheaper, lower-quality variants that it can import from places like China or Malaysia. Russia is losing on two fronts. Not only is it unable to produce large numbers of new tanks or even refurbish their old ones to anything resembling a modern standard, it's being forced to pay exponentially greater prices for supplies needed to create the small number of modern tanks it manages to crank out. The combination of low production and skyrocketing cost is a death blow for a cash-strapped Russian government who blew through its projected annual defense financing in the first few months of 2023. And new sources of revenue aren't forthcoming. European price caps on Russian oil, inherent inefficiencies in Russia's extraction and processing, and now even greater costs in shipping to places like Asia have all conspired to make Russia's oil revenues reach about break-even levels. This is a disaster for the Russian government's budget, because Russia's oil and natural gas industries accounts for about 20% of its GDP and about 45% of its budget just one month before invasion. Making matters worse, Russia now has begun to tax its own oil industry based on Brent crude prices rather than its own oil prices, meaning energy companies in Russia have to pay taxes on revenue they did not generate. As if problems weren't bad enough, even in the best-case scenario that Russian energy is at break-even revenue, this is still a national disaster. At break-even levels, energy companies can't afford to invest in new infrastructure or exploratory missions to expand operations. That means no new oil fields coming online, no replacement of bad infrastructure, and no addressing inefficiencies in Russian production that it used to rely on Western technology to overcome or at least mitigate. Russian energy is in the same death spiral its tank forces are, but Ukraine is in an equally if not more immediately precarious position. Because while it'll take years for Russian energy and thus the budget to go bust, Ukraine is wholly reliant on its Western partners. If the West's financial or military support wavers, even poorly equipped Russian forces could secure victory. So while Russian tank fleets might be in a laughable state right now, as Cold War antiques are dragged out of museums, at least it still has tanks to put on the battlefield. Ukraine is stuck with what it has, a constantly diminishing quantity that only Western support can replenish. A T-55 is a big joke on a modern battlefield, until suddenly your side has no more tanks and no more anti-tank missiles to stop it with. Russia has a big problem in Ukraine, and its name is Wagner Group. The Wagner Group has been growing in infamy after first making it to the forefront of the media spotlight for its involvement in the 2014 illegal annexation of Crimea. Since then, the group's activities have come into clearer focus, and so has the long list of atrocities that the group has committed in the name of its own and Russia's national interests. Connected all the way to the very top of the Kremlin, the Wagner Group has taken a leading role in the war for Ukraine, mostly because its forces are just slightly more effective than the regular Russian army. 
and now its leader, leading candidate for Lurch in a Russian Adams Family reboot, Yevgeny Prigozhin, is threatening to pull Wagner out of Ukraine altogether. Though we're confident by the time you see this, he'll have changed his mind, because it's all naturally just for show. But how did Russia's most effective asset in Ukraine turn into one of its biggest headaches? Wagner's shadow origins trace back to around 2008, allegedly founded by Dmitry Utkin, who, like any good Russian, hates Nazism and is most definitely not a neo-Nazi himself. Dmitry was born in Ukraine and joined the Russian GRU, becoming a lieutenant colonel in the Russian Special Forces before retiring to the Slavonic Corps in 2013 to fight on the side of Sirius Bashar al-Assad. Because also like a good Russian, Dmitry often finds himself on the right side of history. Apparently, fighting for the Slavonic Corps wasn't profitable enough for Dmitry as he just left a few months later and returned to Moscow to found the Wagner Group. Allegedly fascinated with all things German, the group was apparently named after Richard Wagner, a composer and conductor who was perhaps unsurprisingly wildly racist and had a lot of things to say about minorities and their influence on both society and music. Naturally, Wagner was one of Hitler's favorite composers. Dmitry, a good Russian that stands against all things Nazi, absolutely loved that and adopted Wagner as his own call sign, and later the name of his mercenary company. Dmitry was spotted in Crimea in February 2014, and shortly after supporting the Donbass separatists. Apparently, though, some of the Luhansk People's Republic commanders weren't up to his standards, and he is alleged to have murdered several of them. He returned to Syria with his mercenaries in 2015, but Dmitry would disappear from the public eye by 2016. The real question all along was where did Dmitry get the money to start the Wagner Group, and this is where Prigozhin comes in. After spending 12 years in prison for robbery, Prigozhin got his humble start to supervillainhood by selling hot dogs alongside his mother in a flea market of Leningrad. Apparently, his mom made good hot dogs because their small stand brought in enough rubles for Prigozhin to invest in several businesses following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Naturally, this is obviously complete crap. Prigozhin almost certainly returned to robbing and stealing, investing ill-gotten funds into legal enterprises. Eventually, Prigozhin would go all ratatouille and open a restaurant, then a second restaurant on the St. Petersburg waterfront which became a hit. Putin himself would end up dining there, and from the moment the two laid eyes on one another, it was a match made in the eighth circle of hell. You know, the one with the poop river where flatterers spend eternities drowning in excrement? Prigozhin would go on to deny any involvement with Wagner until September 2022 when Wagner was pretty much the only part of the Russian military not actively being routed by Ukraine. Like a bad rash, Wagner has shown up all over the world and will always be in support of Russia's interests. The mercenary group was confirmed to be operating in Syria by 2015, one month after Russia decided to join in support of Assad. Despite private military companies being illegal in Russia, Wagner was curiously free to operate wherever it wanted and build bases and training facilities inside Russia itself. It even shared some facilities directly with the Russian military and recruited straight from its ranks. When sent to Syria, Wagner fought directly under the instruction of the Russian government, a neat trick for what would basically be a criminal enterprise. But Wagner's legality was hand-waved away by Putin, and anyone who dared question it would find themselves suffering an accident while peering out a high window. Wagner suited Putin perfectly, as it allowed him to directly intervene in conflicts around the world while maintaining plausible deniability. Also, getting your own military killed is bad for press, even in such a repressive country as Russia, and dead mercenaries don't receive state funerals. That's a neat trick the US figured out years ago in the Middle East, when it basically resurrected mercenaries as a full-time profession. Wagner's role in Syria was to supplement Assad's poorly trained forces. Wagner mercenaries would serve as shock troops or fill combat specialist roles lacking in the Syrian army, such as forward air controllers for loitering Russian planes. In a turn of events that should make you question if you're living in an alternate universe, Wagner even fought on the side of the good guys against ISIS, developing a specialized unit known as ISIS Hunters to take down key ISIS leadership. However, it wasn't a shared respect for law and order that motivated Wagner. It was Russia's desire for ISIS to stop tearing Syria apart long enough for the country to exploit its resources and expand its naval bases there. By all accounts, Wagner did pretty well for itself. But on at least one occasion, it forgot for a moment that it wasn't actually an elite military force when it went into combat against an actual elite military force. In what would be known as the Battle of Kasham, Wagner led a force of approximately 500 in an assault on a position held by Syrian Democratic Forces and about a dozen U.S. Special Forces. The presence of the U.S. service members was well known to the Russians, who directly oversaw Wagner's every move via the GRU. 
and was meant to send a message for the US to get out of town. Instead, Wagner and its Syrian allies got absolutely rocked by apocalyptic levels of American firepower delivered by F-22s, F-15s, B-52s, AC-130 gunships, Apache helicopters, Reaper and Shadow drones, and in a taste of things to come, M777 howitzers and high Mars batteries. The only casualty on the friendly side was one SDF soldier wounded, with Russia suffering so many Wagner casualties that the bodies had to be flown to Russia in secret. There would be no further direct confrontations between Wagner and the US military in Syria. In Syria, though, the world would get a taste of Wagner's now famous brutality. The PMC specifically targeted civilians in order to sow fear and panic, assisting the official Russian military campaign striking city centers such as Aleppo. Wagner's on-the-ground brutality included a now infamous video of its mercenaries using a sledgehammer on an old Syrian man, breaking his various extremities one by one before delivering a fatal blow to his head. This was par for the course for Wagner, and Prigozhin would later send sledgehammers to news organizations and reporters he wished to intimidate. In Sudan, Wagner had been working at the behest of Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir, to assist in the ongoing civil war. Their presence was rumored by the return of Russian mercenaries to Russia in 2013 for treatment for a severe form of malaria. In December 2017, a video of Wagner PMCs training Sudanese forces surfaced, confirming the group's presence in the country. There, the group helped train regime forces but also directly secured gold, uranium, and diamond mines, with Wagner often using force to secure better deals for Russian companies exporting the extracted minerals. Likewise, Wagner would be deployed to the Central African Republic, where it protected lucrative mining prospects. The companies alleged to control multiple mines directly, earning billions in profits in work conditions that are rumored to be brutal for the miners. UN efforts to gain video evidence of Wagner's brutality have met with failure, as the company has shot down every UN surveillance drone dispatch to overfly the mining sites. The company would also use its famous internet troll farm that interfered in the 2016 US election on behalf of Vladimir Putin to directly attack the French in the Central African Republic. Using social media, Wagner helped spread a deep anti-French sentiment across the country, which would be one of the multiple factors leading to France's exit. Wagner took full advantage of the power vacuum in the country to insert itself and promote Russian interests. Wagner's brutality would be exposed once more as survivors of a Wagner massacre spoke to international media about Wagner mercenaries torturing, killing, and disemboweling women, including several pregnant ones. In Madagascar, Wagner was dispatched in April 2018 to guard political consultants hired by Prigozhin, sent to help the upcoming campaign of President Harry Rajanavaramapiana. Playing both sides against the middle, Prigozhin was simply looking for a win, and it's alleged that the advisors he dispatched were secretly helping multiple candidates. Before leaving office, President Rajanavaramapiana would facilitate the takeover of Madagascar's national chromite producer by a Russian firm, and soon after, Wagner PMCs were sent to guard local chrome mines. In Libya, Wagner operative sightings were first initially reported in October 2018, with bases in Benghazi and Tobruk. The PMC directly supported the Libyan National Army, providing training and direct combat assistance, including operating Russian air defenses provided by the government. The PMCs also acted as snipers, mine layers, and helped create IEDs while providing artillery support with their own privately owned howitzers. Wagner soldiers were also alleged to be utilizing hollow point ammunition illegal under international rules of war. The group's brutality naturally persisted with the direct targeting of civilians such as the murder of a family who had accidentally stumbled across one of their positions. The PMC was specifically named in a UN report on the slavery, rape, and torture of migrants within Libya. After US Congress announced it was preparing sanctions on Wagner and other PMCs inside of Libya, a US military drone was shot down by Russian air defenses operated by mercenaries. Shortly after, 25 Wagner mercenaries ceased to exist after a US drone strike on their position because Wagner had apparently not yet learned it's not a professional military force and is instantly annihilated by a real military power. In Mali and Mozambique, Wagner PMCs were accused of carrying out massacres of civilians. However, in Mozambique, the group was forced to curtail its activities after getting its nose seriously bloodied and fighting against Islamic extremists. The French military would publicize images in April of 2022 of Wagner covering over a mass grave in Mali that they filled with a dozen corpses, with plans to blame the massacre on the French. The PMC would be accused by refugees of robbing villages alongside the Malayan military, as well as killing civilians that they came across. 
Wagner has also been operational across various other countries, though most of its focus has been in Africa, leading to a significant expansion of Russian influence in the continent. However, it's Ukraine where Wagner has been most active, and what was once Putin's most useful tool is now a massive headache. The Russian military is pretty terrible at its job. Wagner, having the capital to hire some of the best, has performed much better. The PMC has taken and defended objectives that the Russian regular forces have been unable to, and the Battle of Bakhmut is largely being fought by Wagner. Early on in what's become the longest battle of the war, Prigozhin bragged about securing Bakhmut in a matter of weeks. Ukraine has had something to say about that, and as of the writing of this script, Wagner and the Russian military are still paying a blood price for the insignificant town whose only strategic value is the absolutely stupid amount of casualties Ukraine has been able to inflict on Russia. But Wagner's successes have also been a problem for Russia, and it all has to do with the way Vladimir Putin runs his government. Like any good dictator, Putin knows the biggest threat to his power is having a competent subordinate, or even just having a small number of them band together against him. That's why he has purposely filled his government's senior most positions with loyal yes-men who absolutely hate each other. Sergei Shoigu, for instance, is a Kremlin outsider, a no-name peasant who knew how to play the corruption game and rose up the ranks, but is an absolute outsider to the Russian oligarchs who control most of the country. This is perfect for Putin, as it ensures Shoigu's loyalty to him and him alone. And thus, despite his truly brilliant levels of incompetence, Shoigu remains Russia's Minister of Defense. But that incompetence has a very real battlefield cost, and Shoigu's military has largely been unable to accomplish any of its strategic goals in Ukraine. This is where Prigozhin comes in, with his private military company that's not supposed to really exist. Where the Russian army failed, Wagner has succeeded, or at least failed less. And this has won Prigozhin favor in Putin's eyes. Because Prigozhin and Shoigu absolutely hate each other, it also prevents the head of his military and the leader of the most successful military force in Ukraine, that's not Ukrainian, from banding together to topple Putin. And Putin's been adding fuel to the fire in order to keep that rivalry lively and intense, including giving Wagner access to the country's prisons in order to bolster its forces, as well as directly supplying it from the Russian military stocks. But that same rivalry which is so good at keeping Putin in power also directly sabotages the Russian military effort in Ukraine. Rather than just operating under one unified command structure, Russian forces in Ukraine are actually just a splintered group of factions all vying for their own interests. Even Sergei Shoigu has his own PMC, Patriot, which is naturally directly at odds with Wagner. But it's also at odds with the Russian military because Patriot's success means more money in Shoigu's pocket. Naturally, this completely disincentivizes the various forces from working together. This was best on display in the Battle of Volodar, where Russian forces ran into the exact same ambush repeatedly since none of the other groups were sharing intelligence with each other. As has been famously said by an unnamed Ukrainian soldier, we're very lucky they are so fucking stupid. The rivalry between Shoigu and Prigozhin, Wagner and the Russian military has now become Russia's biggest headache. On the eve of taking Bakhmut, Prigozhin announced that his forces would be leaving the city. This announcement came after comments for weeks that Wagner would leave all of Ukraine. And the reason why Prigozhin was throwing a little princess temper tantrum? Sergei Shoigu. While the rivalry has been causing issues for nearly the entire length of the war, it heated up after the fall of Soledar near Bakhmut. After weeks of fighting, Russia captured the town and its lucrative salt mines, some of the largest in Europe. Wagner claimed credit. The Russian military refuted this, claiming it had been its forces which had taken Soledar. Prigozhin retorted by posting a photo of himself along with some of his goodest boys deep in one of the salt mines. The Russia MOD fired back that it's been its forces that actually took Solidar, with Wagner playing only a minor role. It's likely that Shoigu desperately needed a public relations win for the beleaguered Russian military, which is why it seemed like Putin backed him up. However, it's also likely that Shoigu simply wanted to diminish Prigozhin so he didn't threaten his own position as Putin's personal lapdog. Inevitably, Prigozhin began to fire back. Never shy about dismissing the efforts of the Russian military, Prigozhin began to directly attack this statement on social media, along with his commanders. Using his network of military commentators, Prigozhin fueled a series of attacks against Shoigu's Ministry of Defense, always careful not to tread on the big man himself by questioning the efficacy of the war itself. Shoigu fired back by cutting Wagner off from Russian military supplies, which had an immediate and severe impact on Wagner's ability to conduct operations. A shell shortage was so critical 
that in some areas Ukraine actually gained the shell advantage against Russian forces for the first time in the war. Prigozhin famously took to social media once more to publicly claim that the MOD was purposefully sabotaging him and his forces. But Shoigu wasn't done, as the Russian military moved to limit Wagner's ability to operate by denying vehicles and even direct fire support while Wagner troops were engaged in combat. All this came to a head at the start of May, with Prigozhin releasing a fiery tirade on video, pretending he cared about the dozens of corpses behind him, while blaming Shoigu's Ministry of Defense for their deaths. The video was an appeal to every babushka back home who had lost sons or grandsons in the fighting, and to up the ante, Shoigu then stomped his little foot down and threatened to take his ball and go home. If the Russian MOD didn't open up its inventory, Wagner would withdraw from Bakhmut a strategic catastrophe that could have been exploited by Ukraine in the coming offensive. Unsurprisingly, the Russian MOD relented and agreed to supply Wagner once more. However, this is not the end of the story, as Shoigu has now in effect been humiliated by Prigozhin and forced into concessions. Inevitably, the two will continue their bitter rivalry that has in some cases resulted in direct fratricide, with good reason to believe that Wagner and Russian forces have both fired on each other and Wagner has actually given targeting coordinates to Ukraine for positions with senior Russian military officials. Prigozhin has now set the stage for the coming Ukrainian offensive, going so far as to claim on video for the first time that the war effort simply isn't going very well. However, he has been careful to pin the blame on the Russian military leadership itself and cleverly began to shape a narrative for what's expected to be a devastating Ukrainian offensive. However, as the coming offensive goes, Prigozhin has set the stage to avoid blame for the Russian failures, while setting up Shoigu as the fall guy, and the two's bitter rivalry is guaranteed to heat up at the cost of more Russian lives. A woman weeps at the coffin of her dead son Alexei. She'd last seen him alive just a few weeks before when he was recruited to serve in Ukraine. He had no combat experience whatsoever. After merely a few days of training, he joined the Semyonovsky regiment on the front line. Two weeks later, his mother was told he died heroically for his country. Alexei's story is a true one, and just one of the problems plaguing Russia's military right now. Poor training, dare we say criminally inadequate training, is one reason Russia's military is failing right now. It's the prominent reason why young men like Alexei are getting to the battlefield and thinking out loud, I don't know what to do. It's why some men don't want to be there. At times, the proverbial blind have led the blind. Suffice it to say, the effect on troop morale has been devastating. We'll talk about declining morale in depth soon. First, we want to discuss hardware issues. Russia has a lot of them, and Ukraine has a lot of help in the hardware department. The aid parade for Ukraine has become an ever-expanding phenomenon. In terms of military spending, Russia is one of the highest spending countries in the world. In 2021, it placed fifth on the list of the highest defense budgets behind the UK, India, China, and the US. The amount of money it spent was reported to be $65.9 billion. The US was a whopping $800.7 billion. Things have changed somewhat since those budgets were planned. Reuters reported in September 2022 that Russia plans to spend $600 billion on defense and security by 2025. How can Russia even afford that? Over in the US, it was reported in June that a Senate Armed Services Committee voted to approve military spending of $858 billion for 2023. The Defense Secretary in the UK has also said that the country, in spite of current economic woes and now pervasive food banks, will dramatically increase its military spending. In terms of percentage of its GDP, Russia spends more on defense than the other top spenders, although the US isn't too far behind. For 2021, Ukraine spent around $5 billion on defense, which was more of its GDP than Russia, the US, and the UK spent in relation to their GDP. Even so, Russia will soon be spending a ton of money. It's people's money. Money it doesn't have. This will be problematic. As a British journalist said recently, Russia can't afford Putin's war in Ukraine. Money, or lack thereof, is a major issue for Russia, especially as the time goes on. And notice how the journalist called it Putin's war, not Russia's war. The emphasis on Putin is very important. It isn't the first time that Russia is straining its finances to retain some political authority in the world. The country was economically unstable since the end of the Cold War. Vladimir Putin, who would soon be on good terms with the US, only came to power because he unofficially agreed not to go after the oligarchs who took advantage of the chaos that came after the collapse of the Soviet Union. That was okay with the West. Just to give you an example of what we mean, 22 years ago when Putin was Russia's acting president, he was described in the New York Times Magazine with the words utterly professional, a star, sensitive, a man we can do business with, 
a liberal, humane, and decent European. Meanwhile, the Russian people watched on as their country was being pillaged. Many discerning people distrusted Putin, as well as the Western capitalists. This is important to understand for the show today. The Russian public does not want to suffer like that again. Many of them are not supportive of another costly war, even if they do hate the West. This is one of Russia's fundamental problems with this war. A lot of Russians have become skeptical over their country's leadership and the expensive shenanigans it gets up to, and widespread public skepticism is never a good thing for a war effort. Sure, Putin's approval rating has gone from 67% to 77% over the last year, but as more body bags containing sons return to their mothers, we might see more support for the West and less support for the perfidious Putin. The US and Putin know very well what happens when a country stretches itself too thin where cash is involved. With the Ukraine situation, the US and UK might just be biding their time while bringing economically struggling Russia to its already scuffed knees. This is partly the reason why the US has spent at least $54 billion on aid to Ukraine. It's why some Democratic and Republican politicians want to spend much more. Money matters a lot in this war, and Ukraine has no shortage of very rich countries happy to bankroll the excessively pricey conflict. The numbers keep changing, but some sources say the US has already spent about $25 billion in military aid alone, with the rest being humanitarian aid and other kinds of help. The UK comes next with a military-only aid package of just over $4 billion. Next is Poland, $1.8 billion, then Germany at $1.2 billion, and Canada at $1.03 billion. As we said, the numbers are changing all the time since new packages keep getting approved. For instance, bipartisan legislators in the US recently introduced a bill to give the Pentagon emergency powers to sell as many weapons as it wants to Ukraine. The 50-odd countries that are sending aid to Ukraine are collectively spending over $100 billion, although it should be said that some countries are sending warm gloves and toothbrushes, while others are sending very expensive modern weapons. Meanwhile, Russia's military aid from around the globe adds up to something close to the value of a brass button. Russia isn't getting financial aid. Although it's said Belarus is offering non-economic aid, and there are tens of thousands of mercenaries fighting for Russia, still, judging economic aid for Russia and Ukraine is like comparing Mount Everest to a mouse. As for China, the alliance of the US with some Asian nations might be enough to make China concerned, but so far it hasn't openly offered support for Russia's war effort. Even those who say the conflict is a US proxy war have condemned Russia. We're trying to say that Russia isn't going to get any considerable help anytime soon and help for Ukraine is seemingly bottomless. Right now, things are looking like one of those us versus rest of the world soccer matches. It's like the old movie Escape to Victory, when the evil Nazi guards and the mixed nationality POW guys played a soccer game. Guess who wins? So, one of Russia's biggest problems is the fact that it's fighting a war alone against a country that's supported on almost a global scale. This cannot be underestimated. Sure, the US and the UK aren't officially sending soldiers to fight on the front lines, even if some of the citizens in those countries would like that. Instead, what they're sending in aid is indispensable to Ukraine's war effort. In June, it was reported that the UK just sent over 6,500 shoulder-mounted anti-air armor weapons and Javelin anti-tank missiles to Ukraine. It sent hundreds of millions of dollars of what the press just called lethal weapons. Some of the packages included M109 howitzers, anti-tank weapons, multiple launch rocket systems, and hundreds of air defense missiles. As for the US, it's raining lethal weapons down on Ukraine, reminiscent of a biblical flood. It's like a supermarket sweep for Ukraine, but with weapons instead of groceries. The US has also sent scores of Javelin anti-tank missiles, as well as billions of dollars in Stinger anti-aircraft missiles, helicopters, counter-artillery, Humvees, electronic warfare detection systems, M777 howitzers, armored personnel carriers, light anti-armor weapons, AT4 anti-armor systems, and the list goes on and on. You might be wondering how this has affected Russia's war effort. The answer is in a big way. If you've been following what's going on, you'll know that the Ukraine advance later in the year pushed the Russians out of the strongholds. Towns are liberated, only for the liberators to find mass graves, and what the Western media referred to as a giant scrap heap of Russian tanks. You'll notice in the list of lethal weapons we just talked about, many of the tools the West provided can be very effective at taking out tanks. After the Russians had retreated from those strongholds, after months of being there and wreaking havoc on locals, masses of tanks were left sometimes with the burned bodies of young Russian soldiers inside them. In part, thanks to all that aid, Ukraine has been kicking the living daylights out of Russian tanks. And we aren't just talking about the older tanks, the T-62s and T-72s, but some of the newer T-90s. Russia has always been a leading nation when it came to tank tech. 
but right now, its tank strategy sucks. So let's just say for now that many young Russian soldiers are not too keen on getting into one of those tanks. The chances of being incinerated are high, all for a war they might not properly understand and don't want to be a part of. If Ukraine wasn't being helped, the conflict would turn out very differently. You already know Ukraine doesn't have a massive military budget. It has only 200,000 active personnel compared to Russia's 850,000 active personnel. Ukraine only has about 2,500 tanks of its own, although it has lost some recently too. Russia has about 12,000 tanks, even though it's been losing about 10 a day since Ukraine advanced. So make no mistake, all that aid is considerably helping Ukraine. But the problem for Russia isn't just about machines. Its tactics have been less than brilliant. Its support of troops has been lacking at times. For instance, Russian tanks should have the requisite modern armor to defend themselves, but that's often not what happened. Russian tank crews have complained that they've been ordered to advance at times when there hasn't been adequate reconnaissance. That is insane. But worse, the tanks are often out in the open, not moving with sufficient infantry and artillery. You don't have to be a military genius to know that shouldn't happen. Even after playing your first game of Risk, you'll understand that. When these tanks are left so vulnerable, all those Ukrainian anti-tank weapons do their worst. At times, Russian tanks have been sitting ducks when fired upon from close range by all those javelins and new generation light anti-tank weapons that the UK and the US have been so kind to send over. As the BBC reported, US supplied anti-tank weapons have been among the most effective weapons in Ukraine's arsenal. Since these weapons aim for the top of the tanks where they're the weakest, they result in something called pop tops. That means when the turret is blown off, it almost always means the three men inside die. It's an awful way to go, we expect. So how do you think Russian soldiers feel about this? The Russians have lost tanks en masse, maybe about 2,500, and a good portion of them have been abandoned. Their crews just got out and ran for their lives. Some soldiers have said they'll never return to the front line. What they saw there was a strategic blunder after strategic blunder. They felt way too vulnerable, as though they were being sent to their deaths. It wasn't a fight at all, it was an annihilation. One of the Russian soldiers later said, We were like blind kittens. I'm shocked by our army. It wouldn't cost much to equip us. Some of the tanks didn't have proper armor. Tanks should have explosive reactive armor or active armor, but reports state that some Russian tank crews had taken to covering their turrets with wood or with iron cages they'd found. They were doing tank DIY, which might sound funny if you've never heard the screams of your friends being burned alive. Remember we talked about Russia being financially stretched? Is that affecting how well these tanks are performing? Analysts have been scratching their heads at the heavy losses of Russian tanks. They say those tanks should have the right armor to protect against these types of attacks, and even though anti-tank weapons can still be catastrophic to an armored machine, they shouldn't have been going down as fast as they have. Analysts have said it's been a problem with maintenance of the armor or perhaps the absence of armor, or the tank crews not being trained in ERA systems. Experts are saying that Russian tank armor is proving to be about eight times less effective than the tank armor that NATO uses. This could be a matter of money, lack of expertise, a lack of good leadership, or all those things combined. This dubious doctrine has often led to tanks grouping together, forming a great big sitting duck traffic jam. At times, the tank crews have been moving without any support, and when they have support, it's often from guys who are flipping burgers or fixing someone's plumbing not a few weeks earlier. Low morale is the reason many Russians don't want to fight. It's why some have abandoned their tanks or their posts pretty quickly. One Russian soldier said he was among 78 guys in his brigade that refused orders and said they would fight no more. He told a journalist, I'm morally exhausted. There's absolutely no trust in the authorities and the higher command. I'm tired, homesick. My daughter was born three months ago. Another said, I thought a long time about it and came to the decision. I understood that I had to refuse so I could stay alive. There are so many reports saying the same things. And let's not forget that due to the retreat of Russian troops, when Ukraine advanced and took back thousands of square miles from the Russians, what was left behind was often something of military value. Ukrainian ammo, for instance, can often be used with captured Russian tanks. There's also the question of centralization. Chechens have been fighting for the Russian army, as has the National Guard as have soldiers hired by private contractors, plus mercenaries, and with this comes the fact that they're fighting without a centralized structure. An analyst said this about that. There are multiple strands of the Russian army with their own agendas, tactics, and reasons for fighting. There have been reports of Russian draft officers approaching guys in the streets and signing them up for fighting, what the press called aggressive recruitment. One guy said he worked in IT and should have been exempted from the draft, but to his utter astonishment, he later found himself saying farewell to his wife and four-year-old kid 
and heading to the front. He did not want to fight, he did not know how to fight. Men like him have been getting just 5 to 10 days of basic training and a further 5 to 15 days of unit training and then they're packed off to the battlefield. To say this is not good would be as obvious as saying you should not enter your cat into a swimming competition with dogs. You guys and girls watching this who are old enough for a military draft, how do you think you'd fare in that amount of training? How do you think you'd deal with hearing your buddies being incinerated in a tank by weapons you know have been sent to your enemy by numerous nations? Do you think you could cope? Many Russians can't, and that's why there are reports coming in from all over about Russian men taking devastating and drastic actions to not fight. We can't say what they did exactly, but we imagine you can guess. As for Alexei, as you know, he had just a few days of training. He went to the front line without knowing the first thing about combat. If you asked him about land warfare strategy or tank armor, he might have looked at you like you'd asked him what he thinks about string theory. Russia has not been very open about sending guys like Alexei into the bloody battle. A journalist for RT said this was plain wrong. She wrote, military leaders, now is not the time to lie. You have no right to lie, and now it is a crime. Alexei's father simply said, my son has died. What am I for? This kind of outside criticism is not good for the Russian war effort. It should be said that Alexei wasn't forced to fight. He just did what was asked of him. A Russian lawyer familiar with the case said, he didn't try to get out of his service. He gathered his things together and he went. He acted bravely. He was brave, for sure. But if you were able to go back in time and ask that drunkard of a philosopher Socrates what he thought about this, he'd tell you that there's a fine line between bravery and ignorance. Alexei and other men like him shouldn't be fighting in a war after so little training. Russia is not Sparta. Most men know nothing about mortal combat. As has happened in the history around the world, Russia has offered some prisoners early release or immediate release if they fight. But are prisoners your best option? Often men become prisoners from a lack of self-control. Perhaps a childhood of trauma has led to their frontal lobes not kicking in when they get mad. This is the last thing you want in a war. History tells us convicts don't usually make the best soldiers. You don't want lunatics fighting for you. Anyway, some prisoners might not be too fond of the state that locked them up. Do you think they'd risk their lives for it? And if some rather violent psychopaths ended up in control of Ukrainian towns and their citizens, what do you think they might do with total impunity to kill? Psychos don't win wars, all-out enraged assaults don't win fights, strategy and emotional control do. Not only that, but many of the best trained men are dead, and they'll be hard to replace. In September, the BBC reported that 1,000 Russian officers had succumbed. It was BBC Russia, so we had to translate, but here's how the article started. The BBC, based on open sources, managed to identify more than 6,020 Russian soldiers who died in the war in Ukraine. Particularly sensitive losses were suffered by special forces units as well as junior officers. It will not be easy to make up for their lack in a Russian army. Russia's soldiers, the ones properly trained with combat experience, are educated in what Russia is an expert at. That is short-lasting, hyper-intensive combat. The Russian military was virtually designed for this, and this war is anything but that. While Ukraine has been getting ready for long-term warfare for close to a decade, Russia might well be playing the long game here, but there's no doubt that it has done badly recently and morale for the most part is about as high as Hades after an earthquake. Nonetheless, as bad as things have looked as of late, Russia is still a military powerhouse for a reason. It's made some mistakes, sure, some of its troops have watched them and are not impressed, but by the time the show comes out, maybe Russia will have improved matters. Despite these losses, we should not underestimate the Russian military. This pretty much contradicts what you've heard today. But the failures of the Russian military we've discussed have happened. The support we've told you Ukraine has is very much real. Ok, so what's behind Russia's underperformance besides what we've discussed? The same analyst we just quoted said Russia's massive weapons arsenal is from several generations and that might make it quite inflexible. The more losses Russia faces, the more equipment comes out of storage warehouses, and so on the whole you have more technical inflexibility. When you add it all up, and we haven't even gone into the corruption in the Russian military and the present lack of exceptional leadership, things are not looking good for Russia. The number of young folks that are willing to fight is getting smaller, and the number of troops in the field is diminishing. They are outnumbered and outmoraled. We know that's not a word. The public might soon turn on Putin especially when military spending increases. We just hope when the last straw that breaks the camel's back is dropped, no one makes a grab for the nuclear launch codes. The natural thing to watch now is what if Russia launched a nuclear bomb minute by minute? Or forget about war and take a ride in the infographics time machine 
in the end of civilization century by century.